Dead America. Tales of the First Month. Earth of the Purifiers. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 1. 8.37 p.m. At the southwestern tip of Florida nestled the quaint town of Everglades City, its population of 400 souls swelling during the summer months with eager tourists seeking the thrill of fishing and the allure of the state's offerings. However, this night brought a different kind of visitor to its shores. Rain lashed against the windows of a modest bungalow near the town's southern edge, situated a mere 20 yards from the bay's waters. There was little to buffer the relentless onslaught of the storm that had raged unabated throughout the day. Each gust of wind threatened to shatter the fragile barrier of glass. Yet amidst the tempest, Tobias Walker remained ensconced in his recliner by the front window. A man in his mid-fifties, Tobias and his wife, Carrie, had planted roots here nearly three decades prior. Both had been captivated by the charm of the small town, seeking naught but a tranquil existence. Their days were spent in service to the local high school, Carrie imparting wisdom in English, while Tobias molded young minds in the realm of metalwork. They cherished their roles within the community, finding solace in the simplicity of their lives, far removed from the frenetic pace elsewhere in the state. But everything changed 48 hours ago, when Carrie succumbed to the plague sweeping across the nation. Though Tobias lacked the luxury of televised updates, the whispers carried through his radio broadcasts painted a grim picture. His beloved wife had fallen victim, her passing marked by a fate far worse. She had risen again, a monstrous aberration. In the confines of his chair, Tobias sat in silent vigil, his gaze fixed upon the tumult outside, punctuated by occasional glances at the Bible resting upon the nearby end table, a tone that had guided his every step, now a testament to his wavering faith. In the throes of despair, he felt abandoned, as if the divine presence he had long revered had forsaken him. Tobias pushed aside the oppressive thoughts, finding a semblance of distraction in the persistent banging emanating from the back bedroom. For hours, it had persisted, a discordant accompaniment to the howling winds outside. With each thud against the door, Tobias felt the weight of his situation bearing down upon him. His wife, now a mindless husk driven by insatiable hunger, clawed desperately at the barrier between them. Despite the chaos unfolding mere steps away, Tobias remained rooted in his seat, his eyes shut tight against the onslaught of noise. Yet, the incessant pounding pierced through his attempts at mental fortitude, growing louder and more insistent with each passing moment. It echoed through the confines of the house, drowning out all other sound until it became an oppressive cacophony. Drawing a steadying breath, Tobias resolved to confront the inevitable. With a whispered plea to a higher power, he sought solace in the act he was about to undertake, a plea for forgiveness mingled with a hint of defiance. Lord, forgive me for what I am about to do, he murmured, his voice barely audible above the din. But then, with a sudden resolve, he shook his head, the tremor of determination evident in his voice as he spoke aloud to the empty room. No, this is not a decision that I have made. This is a decision that has been forced upon me. Tobias declared, his words ringing with a conviction born of desperation. I have lived. Tobias's mind drifted to memories of his beloved wife, their shared joys and trials flickering through his consciousness. No, we have lived our lives with grace and honor. He spoke softly, his voice carrying the weight of sorrow and resignation. And now, this plague has not only destroyed our home, our lives, but every life and home, whether they were virtuous or vile. With a somber resolve, Tobias rose from his seat, his footsteps echoing in the quiet of the kitchen as he retrieved a large knife from the counter. He held it in his hand, its weight a tangible reminder of the task that lay ahead. Stealing himself for what must be done, Tobias embarked on the solemn journey down the hallway, his grip tightening around the handle of the blade. The incessant banging from behind the bedroom door drowned out the fury of the storm outside, a grim testament to the horror that awaited him within. Carrie, I have loved you since the moment we met, Tobias whispered, his voice trembling with emotion as he addressed the unseen presence beyond the threshold. I devoted my life to you. A lump formed in his throat as he struggled to find the words to convey his anguish. And with this final act, I free you from the hell that has been forced upon you, he declared. Tobias's hand clenched around the doorknob, his heart pounding with a mixture of dread and determination. 
With a forceful shove, he burst into the room, the door colliding with the undead visage of Carrie, momentarily staggering her. Without a moment's hesitation, Tobias advanced, his large frame moving with purpose as he seized her by the throat. He averted his gaze, his focus fixed solely on the task at hand, the blade in his hand a weapon against the nightmare that had consumed his wife. With a swift, decisive motion, he plunged the knife towards her forehead, the blade finding its mark with brutal precision. As life drained from her, Tobias cradled her limp form in his arms, tears streaming down his face as he whispered words of solace. You're at peace now, Carrie. You're at peace, he murmured, his voice choked with emotion as he held her close, unwilling to let go. Minutes stretched into eternity as Tobias remained in silent vigil, the weight of grief crushing him as he struggled to reconcile the loss of his beloved. Eventually, he summoned the strength to release her, tenderly laying her to rest upon the bed. With a final, loving gesture, he tucked her in, ensuring her comfort and death as he lingered by her side, his gaze focused upon her serene features. Reluctantly tearing himself away, Tobias exited the room, the broken door offering scant resistance as he closed it behind him. Collapsed in the hallway, his anguish found voice in a primal scream, the sound echoing through the empty corridors as grief consumed him. Minutes stretched into eternity as he wrestled with his pain, before finally rising to his feet, the weight of loss heavy upon his shoulders. Staggering into the kitchen, Tobias sought refuge in mundane tasks, the rhythmic splash of water against his face a feeble attempt to quell the torrent of tears. He stood at the sink, his gaze fixed upon the storm raging outside, a tumultuous reflection of the tempest within. After several agonizing minutes of contemplation, Tobias nodded to himself, his hand trembling as he reached for another knife from the counter. With a sense of resignation, he pressed the blade against his wrist, teetering on the precipice of ending his own suffering. There is nothing left in this godforsaken world for you, Tobias. Nothing. Carrie is gone, and you have no purpose, he muttered, the weight of despair heavy upon his shoulders as he prepared to succumb to the darkness. His resolve wavered as he poised the knife, poised to inflict the final, irrevocable act upon himself. But then, a sound pierced through the tempest outside, a rhythmic banging reminiscent of the horrors lurking within his own home. Halting his motion, Tobias strained to identify the source of the disturbance, his gaze drawn towards the neighboring house, barely visible through the veil of rain. Illuminated by a sudden flash of lightning, he discerned two figures, attempting to breach the sanctuary of the living. Confusion gripped him, for he had believed himself to be the sole survivor in this desolate landscape, the virus and its aftermath leaving him isolated and bereft. With a resigned sigh, Tobias set the knife aside. As he focused his attention on the scene unfolding beyond the window, another flash of lightning revealed a lone figure standing inside. A young man, alive amidst the sea of death, his gaze fixed upon the encroaching horrors trying to break in. Tobias's gaze shifted heavenward, a silent plea directed towards the indifferent heavens above. So that's your plan? To give me purpose? He murmured, his voice tinged with a hint of defiance amidst the despair. Tobias stood in silent contemplation, his gaze lingering on the knife for a moment longer before his attention was drawn once more to the chaos unfolding outside. The intensifying banging from the neighboring house demanded his focus. The urgency of the situation palpable as cracks began to spiderweb across the window under the relentless assault. I accept this purpose. I will exterminate these abominations from this world, he declared, his voice firm with newfound resolve as he embraced the call to action. Turning away from the knife, Tobias strode purposefully towards the side door, slipping into a pair of weathered work boots and tucking his jeans into them. With a swift motion, he flung open the back door, marching determinedly towards the standalone shed nestled ten yards away. His steps were deliberate, his mind singularly focused on the task at hand, his workshop beckoning like a sanctuary amidst the chaos. With a sense of urgency, Tobias swung open the shed door, slipping inside and securing it behind him before flicking on the solar-powered light. Though the power had faltered throughout the day, the workshop remained bathed in a steady glow, illuminating the tools and implements of war that lined the walls. Formerly a history teacher turned metalworker, Tobias's passion for weaponry was evident in every corner of the workshop. Spears and swords adorned the walls alongside a collection of shields, each meticulously crafted with care and skill honed over years of practice. 
He had hoped that one day he would be able to retire and begin competing in blacksmithing competitions, but fate had another plan. Tobias stood at the center of his workshop, his gaze sweeping over the array of weapons adorning the walls, each holding a promise of defense against the encroaching darkness. He reached for a small round shield, slipping his left arm through the leather straps with practiced ease. As he contemplated his choice of armament, Tobias's thoughts turned to the age-old dilemma of power versus reach. The sword gives power, but the spear gives reach, he mused aloud, his voice echoing in the confines of the workshop. His decision made, Tobias reached for the spear a weapon of considerable length with a razor-sharp tip and a sturdy leather grip. With the weapon in hand, he turned towards the door, another flash of lightning illuminating the yard beyond. However, a moment of doubt crept into his mind as he glanced down at his metal spear, realizing its potential to be a lightning rod. I leave it to you, Lord, he murmured. I will strike down these abominations if it is your will. If it is not your will, then you have a quick way to let me know. With a deep breath to steady his nerves, Tobias stepped out into the yard, the deluge of rain battering against his face as he advanced towards the looming threat. Despite the deafening roar of the storm, his focus remained unwavering, fixed upon the ghouls that sought to breach the sanctity of his neighbor's home. With each determined step, Tobias closed the distance, the sounds of his approach masked by the tempest raging around him. Though he caught a glimpse of the young man watching from the window, his attention remained fixed upon the task at hand. As he neared the first ghoul, its grotesque form pressed against the window in a frenzied attempt to break through, Tobias lunged forward with the spear, the weapon finding its mark with lethal precision. With a forceful thrust, the spear impaled both creature and house, leaving the lifeless ghoul pinned in its final moment of agony. But before Tobias could retrieve his weapon, the second ghoul surged towards him with unnatural speed. Reacting instinctively, he raised the shield, bracing himself for the impact. As the ghoul collided with him, Tobias ducked low, driving the shield into its chest with all his strength. The force of the blow sent the creature hurtling over his head. As the ghoul crashed to the ground with a resounding thud, Tobias wasted no time in seizing the opportunity presented to him. With a swift spin, he brought the shield down with force, the impact striking the bridge of the creature's nose with a sickening crack. Undeterred, Tobias pressed his advantage, raising the shield once more and delivering a relentless series of blows to the same spot. With each strike, Bone yielded to the force of his assault, until finally the shield pierced through, driving into the creature's brain with a final, decisive blow. As the ghoul convulsed in its death throes, Tobias swiftly retrieved his spear from the house, wrenching it free from its impromptu pinning. With a sense of grim satisfaction, he watched as the defeated creature slumped lifelessly to the ground. Another bolt of lightning illuminated the yard, casting stark shadows against the rain-soaked landscape. Tobias's gaze was drawn to the window, where a young man stood transfixed in the glow of the storm. Though his features were obscured by the darkness, Tobias could see the urgency in his movements as he gestured towards the front door before dashing away. For a moment, Tobias stood amidst the fury of the storm, his eyes lifted towards the heavens in silent gratitude. Thank you for my purpose, Lord. Chapter 2 Tobias stood outside the door as it swung open, revealing Sawyer, a 17-year-old student and star football player. Mr. Walker? Is that you? Sawyer's voice broke through the din of the storm, uncertainty etched on his features as he peered out into the rain-soaked night. For a moment, Tobias regarded him, trying to place the young man before recognition dawned. Sawyer, what are you doing here? This isn't your house, he remarked, his tone tinged with surprise. I'll explain everything. Just come in out of the rain, Sawyer replied, gesturing for Tobias to enter. Surveying the quiet neighborhood, Tobias detected no other signs of movement. With a nod, he followed Sawyer inside, the warmth of the house offering a welcome reprieve from the chill of the storm. Once inside, Tobias glanced around the unfamiliar surroundings before stowing his spear in the umbrella stand and placing his shield beside it. Mr. Walker, that was crazy as hell, man, Sawyer exclaimed, his eyes widening as he caught sight of the bloodied spear. You stabbed that man in the head with a spear. Tobias nodded solemnly. I sure did, Sawyer. And that was no man, 
at least not anymore. It was an abomination, and it needed to be ended. Okay, yeah, I'm with you, Mr. Walker, Sawyer affirmed. We're not in school, Sawyer. Just call me Tobias. Tobias corrected gently. Okay, Tobias. Now, what are you doing in this house? It's not yours, Tobias inquired, his curiosity piqued. As Sawyer held up his hand, Tobias fell silent, allowing the young man a moment to gather his thoughts. Okay, I'll tell you, Tobias, but I got one more question for you, Sawyer began. What's your question? Tobias inquired. Where in the hell did you get a spear from? Sawyer blurted out. Tobias chuckled softly. You never took my metalworking class, did you, Sawyer? No, I didn't. I went for weight training instead, figured it would help me out on the field. But if I had known we'd be making badass weapons like this, I would have reconsidered, Sawyer admitted with a hint of regret. As much as I wanted to teach you kids how to make stuff like this, the school board wanted me to focus on more practical things, like welding. But I got my fill of it on the weekends, much to my wife's dismay, Tobias explained wistfully. Oh yeah, Mrs. Edwards. How's she doing? Sawyer inquired innocently, his expression falling as Tobias's demeanor shifted. Tobias's expression went blank, a fleeting moment of pain crossing his features as he struggled to compose himself. Realizing his mistake, Sawyer quickly backtracked. I'm sorry, Tobias, I didn't mean to. Sawyer apologized earnestly. It's okay, Sawyer. You didn't know. And it was a logical question to ask, Tobias said. With a nod of understanding, Sawyer returned Tobias's gaze, his eyes brimming with emotion as he prepared to answer the original question. Now, what are you doing in a house that isn't yours? Tobias prompted gently. Sawyer hesitated, his voice thick with emotion as he spoke. When all this started, Principal Harris made a group chat with every parent and student he could think of. This isn't a big town, so there's only like 80 people on here. Handing his phone to Tobias, Sawyer watched as the older man inspected the text chain. Hundreds of messages scrolled by, a mix of desperation and hope evident in each one. It still doesn't explain why you're here, Tobias observed, handing the phone back to Sawyer. My girlfriend is Becky Henderson, Sawyer confessed, his voice barely above a whisper. Recognition dawned in Tobias's mind as he pieced together Sawyer's connection to Becky Henderson, his next-door neighbors. Despite their brief acquaintance, Tobias recalled exchanging pleasantries with the Hendersons and recognizing Becky from around school. And you were coming over here to check up on her? Tobias asked. When those messages started coming through, I scoured every single one of them, hoping to see one from her or her parents. I tried texting her directly also, but nothing. No response from her or her parents, Sawyer explained, his voice heavy with emotion. Tobias chuckled softly. Oh, young love, so in the middle of Armageddon, you rushed out to come save her. Sawyer's eyes welled up with tears, and he motioned for Tobias to follow as they made their way down the hallway towards the back bedrooms. The putrid stench that assailed them only served to heighten their sense of dread. I was so worried, so I did what I had to do. After finding what I found I wish that I hadn't, Sawyer admitted, his voice trembling with anguish. As they reached the back of the house, Sawyer pointed towards the closed doors of the two bedrooms. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Tobias offered a reassuring pat on the arm before stepping forward to investigate. Opening the first door, Tobias was met with a sight that turned his stomach. Becky lay in the bed, her head gruesomely disfigured. Unable to bear the sight, Tobias quickly withdrew and slammed the door shut, his gaze meeting Sawyer's in silent acknowledgement before he proceeded to the master bedroom. Inside, the scene was no less horrifying. Mrs. Henderson lay on the floor, her head similarly maimed, while Mr. Henderson sat in a chair with numerous chunks of flesh missing from his arms and the majority of his head shattered by the shotgun that lay on the ground beside him. Best I can tell is that Becky was infected, maybe her mother too, and her dad just. Sawyer's voice trailed off as he struggled to articulate the horror of the scene before them. Tobias approached Sawyer, enfolding him in a tight embrace as the young man broke down in tears once more. The father did what he had to do. They were abominations, they were no longer the family he knew and loved. 
Tobias murmured. Tobias's grip tightened on Sawyer's shoulders as he spoke with conviction, his words carrying the weight of their purpose. Now listen to me, young man. We are here for a reason, and it's to eliminate those abominations and cleanse this world. Sawyer recoiled slightly, taken aback by the forcefulness of Tobias's tone. Breaking free from Tobias's hold, he stepped back, his expression a mix of surprise and defiance. Look, Tobias, I'm not here for any reason. My reason for being here is lying dead in that bedroom, he retorted, his voice tinged with grief and frustration. Before Tobias could respond, Sawyer's phone began to vibrate from the other room, the sound echoing through the quiet house. Tobias watched intently as Sawyer made his way back to retrieve the device, a sense of anticipation hanging in the air. As Sawyer picked up the phone and glanced at the screen, Tobias maintained his stern demeanor, his eyes fixed on the young man. What does it say? He pressed, his voice unwavering. Sawyer's breath caught in his throat as he read over the messages, his expression shifting from confusion to disbelief. It's from Maria, he replied, his voice barely above a whisper. Maria? My assistant Dylan's Maria, his fiancée? Tobias clarified, a glimmer of hope flickering in his eyes. Yeah. Once everybody got up to the school, they saw that the food situation wasn't the greatest, so a few of them headed down to the grocery store. I acted like I was going with them and broke off to come here, Sawyer said. As the phone continued to vibrate, indicating more messages coming through, Tobias's concern deepened. Is everything okay at the grocery store? He inquired, his voice tinged with apprehension. Sawyer scrolled through the messages, his expression growing grim. They got attacked as they got there. A couple of them didn't make it inside, he relayed somberly. Where is Maria now? Tobias pressed, his eyes narrowing with concern. After scanning through a few more messages, Sawyer located the updates from Maria. Okay, here we go. There's a handful of them trapped inside the grocery store in the back office. They don't know how many are out there, only that it's too many for them to handle he reported, his voice tense with worry. Is anyone from the school going to help them? Tobias inquired. Sawyer shook his head as he read through the messages once more. They're trapped as well. There's nearly 50 people in the cafeteria. Principal Harris says that there's a hundred of those things outside, he explained, his voice heavy with apprehension. While I'm sure he's exaggerating, I do believe him when he says that they can't get out. For all his faults, Principal Harris is a straight shooter, Tobias mused, his expression grave. Somebody needs to do something, Sawyer remarked. Tobias regarded Sawyer with a knowing look, a faint smirk tugging at the corners of his lips. Sixty seconds ago you told me that you didn't have a purpose on this earth anymore. Now you're telling me that you do. People are in danger, and you and I are the only two who can do anything about it, he observed, his tone firm. Sawyer paused, considering Tobias's words before nodding in agreement. Okay, I'll help you help them. But for the record, I'm not buying this whole purpose nonsense. I've heard you're a bit on the religious side, and that's fine, but I'm not about that. Are you good with that? He clarified his tone resolute. The Lord works in mysterious ways, Sawyer. It is not my place to show you his ways. My place is to purify this world of those abominations, Tobias replied, his tone unwavering. Let's start with saving Maria and the others from the grocery store and see how it goes from there. It's one thing to fight in a town of 400. It's another thing entirely to talk about fighting a country of 300 million, Sawyer suggested. Fair enough, Sawyer, Tobias agreed, nodding in acknowledgement. So how do we get started? We're going to need weapons, Sawyer asked. Follow me to my shed, Tobias instructed. Sawyer's expression reflected a mix of confusion and awe as he followed Tobias out into the storm and into the shed. As Tobias flipped on the light, revealing the array of weapons inside, Sawyer's eyes widened in amazement. You weren't kidding when you said you had a weekend hobby, Sawyer remarked. It was more of a passion, actually, Tobias replied. Well, it's a shame that your passion wasn't guns because we could really use an arsenal right now, Sawyer commented. On the contrary, Sawyer, we have all the weapons that we need right here, Tobias countered confidently. Guns are messy and loud, 
and we are facing an adversary that is unarmed and single-minded in their actions. They're primal in their instinct. They see prey and they run right at it, without a care in the world. They have no tactical thinking, and we can use that to our advantage, Tobias explained, his voice steady and resolute. How in the world do you know all that? Have you even left your house since all this began? Sawyer inquired. I know this because I've listened to others who have seen it firsthand. Just off the coast are thousands of boats, people who have fled from Miami and Tampa, and all points in between. They have shared their stories with me, and I have paid attention, Tobias replied, his gaze steady. Sawyer glanced at the wall of swords and spears, his expression overwhelmed. Well, Tobias, since you have an idea of what we're facing and how to fight them, I'm open to suggestions, he conceded. Tobias pondered for a moment before retrieving a tall, wide shield from the wall and handing it to Sawyer. Sawyer nearly tipped over from the weight, taken aback by the heft of the shield. You don't mess around, do you? Sawyer remarked, his voice slightly strained. This is my interpretation of a tower shield. It's heavy, but it's intended to be. I added weight at the bottom so that when it's put on the ground and reinforced, it's very difficult to get through, Tobias explained, his tone matter-of-fact. I played cornerback on the football team, so I know all about playing defense, Sawyer remarked. Tobias then handed Sawyer a short sword from the wall. It wouldn't hurt for you to have a little offense as well, he suggested. Okay, let's do this then, Sawyer agreed. With a nod from Tobias, the two of them exited the shed, ready to embark on their rescue mission. Chapter 3 Tobias climbed into the driver's seat of his old blue pickup truck, Sawyer sliding in next to him. They took a moment to shake off the rain, which continued to pour relentlessly outside. Sawyer glanced at the back of the truck, where a small medieval arsenal was hidden beneath a plastic tarp. Meanwhile, Tobias started up the truck, allowing it to idle briefly before switching on the heater. They both welcomed the warmth that soon enveloped them, chasing away the chill of the rain. The grocery store is only half a mile away, Tobias said, his voice calm. I'm going to drive slow, and I want you to take note of any congregation of abominations that we come across. Okay, but how many is a congregation? Sawyer asked. If there are three or more trying to get into a building, I want you to note it, Tobias explained. That would indicate someone might be alive inside. And once we save the day, we will have to go on a hunt. Because by the time the sun comes up tomorrow, this town will be purified of abominations. You got it, Tobias, Sawyer replied, settling back into his seat. Sawyer noticed a spiral notebook with a pen attached to the coils on the dashboard and gestured towards it. May I use this? He asked. Have at it, Tobias replied, already focused on the road ahead. Sawyer flipped open his notebook, hastily sketching out a crude representation of the town. A rectangular shape emerged on the blank page, annotated with key locations, the neighborhood to the south, the central grocery store they were en route to, and the school situated at the town's northern boundary. As they progressed northward, Sawyer meticulously marked tiny symbols on the map to indicate clusters of zombies he spotted along the way. Though their numbers were relatively low, each sighting intensified his apprehension. Are you all right, Sawyer? Just realizing how stupid I was, Sawyer admitted, and hoping that I haven't used up all of my luck. I know you don't believe me when I say it, Tobias responded earnestly, but you're here for a purpose, Sawyer. Sawyer remained silent, unwilling to delve into a philosophical debate, particularly with an imminent confrontation looming. Sensing Sawyer's reluctance, Tobias let the matter drop. We're nearing the supermarket, Tobias announced, redirecting their focus. Sawyer acknowledged with a nod as Tobias steered into the parking lot, positioning the vehicle at the farthest edge of the sparse lot, roughly 30 yards from the store's entrance. A cluster of half a dozen zombies clamored against the front doors, thrashing against the glass. That's a lot of those things, Sawyer remarked, eyeing the undead creatures. We can handle them, Tobias reassured him. Sawyer took a deep breath, steeling himself for the impending encounter. Okay. How do you want to do it? Tobias paused, surveying their surroundings illuminated by a combination of lightning flashes and solar-powered streetlights. Satisfied that no other threats lurked nearby, 
he swiftly formulated a plan. Let's get in the back of the truck, Tobias proposed, already disembarking and clambering into the truck bed. Sawyer's confusion was evident. Wait, really? Without hesitation, Sawyer followed suit, joining Tobias in the bed of the truck. Tobias handed him two spears, a tacit indication of their intended course of action. Hold this for me, Tobias instructed. Yeah, sure, but what's the plan? Sawyer inquired. Tobias acted swiftly, dropping to a knee and sliding open the back window of the truck. He leaned inside and held down the horn for a solid five seconds. Sawyer's eyes widened with a mix of fear and panic, caught off guard by the sudden noise. Frantically scanning their surroundings, he fixated on the half-dozen zombies now hurtling towards them from the front of the store. Rising to his feet, Tobias seized one of the spears before positioning Sawyer in the center of the truck bed, recognizing the young man's tense demeanor. Relax, son, Tobias reassured him, his voice steady. We'll be just fine. How do you know? Sawyer's voice trembled with apprehension. Those things are going to rip us apart. Not as long as we stay where they can't reach us. They can't climb, Tobias explained calmly. Sawyer's brow furrowed. How do you know that? I talked to numerous people who confirmed it, Tobias replied, his tone resolute. Now, when you strike, aim for the head. It's the only way to put them down for good. Sawyer absorbed Tobias' instructions, nodding as he tightened his grip on the spear. And remember Sawyer, Tobias continued, his voice firm, these are not people anymore. Their souls are out of their bodies, and what remains is not only an abomination but a threat to our survival. So act accordingly. Sawyer nodded in acknowledgement, preparing himself as the rain-soaked parking lot served as the battleground. The approaching zombies splashed through the puddles, their grotesque forms drawing closer with each step. Within moments, the first ghoul collided with the truck, its gnarled hands grasping for the two men. Sawyer hesitated, fear paralyzing him momentarily. However, Tobias acted decisively, driving the spear through the creature's forehead, bringing it crashing to the ground. As the rest of the pack converged on their position, Tobias observed their behavior. I told you, they have primal instincts. They just ran straight towards us, they didn't go around. All of them just pushing against one another to reach us. Sawyer nodded, absorbing the insight. He then thrust his spear at the nearest zombie, though his aim was off, slicing open the creature's cheek. Do it again, Tobias instructed, but put more force behind it. Sawyer nodded, his confidence rising with each successful strike. With precision, he delivered forceful blows, each one finding its mark with deadly accuracy. As the ghouls fell under his assault, he glanced at Tobias, finding reassurance in the older man's approving nod. Together, they swiftly dispatched the horde, reducing them to a motionless pile beside the truck. After a brief scan of their surroundings to ensure no further threats loomed, they descended from the truck bed and returned to the front seats. That was fine work out there, Sawyer. Tobias commended as he started the truck and steered towards the store. Thank you, Tobias, Sawyer replied gratefully. Once I got over my nerves, I was able to deliver. Tobias brought the truck to a halt in front of the grocery store, noticing the closed door streaked with blood on the inside. We're going to be fighting them on the ground once we go in there, Tobias cautioned. You just tell me what I need to do, Sawyer responded, ready to follow Tobias' lead. Tobias contemplated for a moment, peering into the dimly lit interior of the store. Unable to discern any movement, he formulated a plan. I want you to send a message to Maria, Tobias instructed. Tell them that we're coming inside. I want them to start making as much noise as they can make, and to keep doing so until we tell them otherwise. You got it, Sawyer affirmed. Sawyer swiftly retrieved his phone, sending the message, and waited anxiously for a response, relishing the warmth from the vent. When the phone vibrated, signaling Maria's confirmation, he relayed the message to Tobias. They said they'll do it, Sawyer reported. Good. Grab your tower shield and sword. It's time to get to work, Tobias instructed. Following Tobias's lead, Sawyer headed to the back of the truck, lowering the tailgate to retrieve the heavy shield. He affixed the sword sheath to his belt as he watched Tobias equip himself with a sword sheath and spear. 
Lead the way, Sawyer said, ready to follow Tobias's lead. Tobias approached the front door, positioning himself a few feet back before driving the spear into the glass with expert precision and force. Where did you learn to fight like that? Sawyer inquired as they prepared to enter. If I was going to make these weapons, I wanted to know how they were used. Because if I knew how someone would use it, I could make a better weapon, Tobias explained. Makes sense, Sawyer acknowledged as Tobias unlatched the door and they cautiously entered, securing it behind them. The echoing sounds of banging reached their ears from the back of the store, signaling both Maria's efforts and the zombies within. Tobias led them through the checkout counters and down the main aisle, scanning the grocery aisles for the source of the commotion. Finally, their destination came into view down aisle six, illuminated by an emergency light. Ten creatures lurked outside the office door, their presence ominous. Sawyer scrutinized the height of his metal shield as they advanced down the aisle. Realizing its potential, he gestured for Tobias to halt, who complied, allowing Sawyer to investigate. Gently laying the shield on its side, Sawyer assessed its width, finding it just long enough to span the opening and rest against the shelves. Satisfied with the makeshift barricade, he signaled Tobias with a thumbs up before they proceeded towards the approaching zombies. Midway down the aisle, Tobias tapped Sawyer on the shoulder, signaling him to stop. Sawyer lifted the heavy shield off the ground, allowing it to connect with the waist-high shelf before dropping the front portion onto the shelf on the other side. The resounding clang of metal on metal reverberated throughout the grocery store, immediately capturing the attention of the zombies by the door. Three of them, enticed by the promise of fresh prey, broke into a sprint towards the source of the noise, followed closely by the others. Sawyer gripped his sword tightly, anchoring himself behind the shield, while Tobias poised his spear for action. As the first creature collided with the barrier, Sawyer stood his ground, planting his feet firmly to prevent any give. With swift precision, Sawyer thrust his sword over the top of the shield, striking the flailing creature in the face and sending it crashing to the ground. Tobias followed suit, dispatching the zombies with ruthless efficiency using his spear. However, as the mob pressed against the shield, its stability began to falter under their weight. Recognizing the impending danger, Tobias dropped his spear and drew his sword, joining Sawyer in the struggle to stabilize the barrier. Despite their best efforts, both men found themselves besieged by the grasping arms of the zombies, making it challenging to land precise strikes with their swords amid the chaos. Nevertheless, they fought on, dispatching the creatures one by one until the grocery store fell silent, save for the banging from inside the office. Tobias surveyed the vanquished creatures, offering a reassuring pat on Sawyer's back. That was some clever thinking with the shield, Sawyer. Do not be afraid to let your intuition take over. Sawyer nodded in acknowledgement, struggling to free the shield from its wedged position. Might need a hand getting it free, though, he admitted. Tobias chuckled as he assisted Sawyer in freeing the shield, which landed with a thud on the ground once released. Sawyer regained a firm grip on it, ready to move on. Come on, let's go see who made it through the day. Chapter 4 Tobias and Sawyer approached the office door, where the persistent banging and yelling from inside continued unabated. Tobias gestured for Sawyer to take the lead, and the young man knocked the familiar shave and a haircut rhythm. Within moments, the cacophony from within ceased, replaced by the sound of heavy furniture being shifted aside. The door swung open, revealing three familiar faces. Maria, weary with blood-spattered blonde hair, stood before them. Behind her stood Grayson, the football captain, and Dylan, Tobias's teaching assistant, seated on the desk. Tobias? What are you doing here? Maria's voice held a mix of surprise and relief. I'm a man on a mission, and my first stop was to come collect you. Tobias replied with a reassuring smile. Maria rushed forward, enveloping Tobias in a tight hug. As they embraced, Sawyer seized the opportunity to greet his teammate, Grayson. Looks like the defense has to come bail out the offense, Sawyer remarked with a grin. There's a first time for everything, Grayson quipped, reciprocating with a hand slap and a bro hug. Meanwhile, Dylan emerged from the room, acknowledging Sawyer with a nod. With Maria's attention now freed, Tobias turned to shake hands with his assistant. 
It's good to see you, Tobias, Dylan greeted warmly. Dylan's gaze fell upon the bloodied weapons and shield, prompting a laugh. Be honest with me, how many years have you dreamed of being able to use those in a real fight? Tobias chuckled in agreement. More than I would ever admit. The room lightened with Dylan's smile, but Tobias couldn't help but notice the underlying sadness in both Dylan and Maria's expressions. Okay, out with it, Tobias prodded. You're being strange. This is the first time in years that you haven't immediately asked about Carrie. Dylan and Maria exchanged sheepish glances before turning their attention back to Sawyer, who cleared his throat to address them directly. They're not asking because I told them already, Sawyer explained, holding up his phone to display the group text thread. I knew it would only bring you pain, and I wanted to spare you from that if I could. Tobias nodded in appreciation before a smile graced his lips. You're a good man, Sawyer. Grayson playfully smacked Sawyer on the chest, jesting, you're one smooth talker if you got him fooled already. Laughter filled the room briefly before the gravity of their situation brought them back to reality. Dylan redirected the conversation. Have you been to the school yet? Tobias shook his head. No, you were on the way, and with just the two of us, we wouldn't have been able to take care of the school on our own. If we're going to save those people and purify our town, we are going to need your help. Purify the town? Grayson questioned, puzzled. Sawyer quickly intervened, smacking Grayson on the arm. Just roll with it, man. I'll explain it later. Grayson acquiesced with a nod, refocusing on the task at hand. Tobias placed his hands on Dylan and Maria's shoulders, locking eyes with them earnestly. I know you two are godly people, and I need your help in this task. Will you join me in destroying these abominations? After a brief moment of contemplation, both Dylan and Maria exchanged nods before turning back to Tobias with enthusiasm. It would be our honor, Tobias, Dylan affirmed. Maria nodded in agreement but voiced a concern. But how are we going to do it? There's a hundred of those things at the school, and there's only five of us. These aren't the only weapons that I brought with me, Tobias reassured them. Every shield, sword, and spear I have crafted is in the back of the truck just outside. We will arm ourselves and take the fight to them. Maria and Dylan nodded in understanding as the group exited the office. As they walked down the snack aisle, Sawyer and Grayson each grabbed a bag of chips, indulging in a handful before casually tossing the bags onto the checkout counter. However, Tobias, noticing the wastefulness, turned around and addressed them sternly, his tone carrying a hint of parental reprimand. Do not be wasteful, Tobias admonished. There is more than a full bag of potato chips you left out to rot. When these shelves are empty, do you think they will be restocked? Do you think that the world is going back to normal anytime soon? Taken aback by Tobias's tone and aggression, Sawyer and Grayson quickly rectified their mistake, closing up their bags and bringing them along. Tobias could see the fear in their eyes and softened his approach. Forgive me, boys, Tobias apologized. I'm a grown man and I am having a great deal of trouble coming to terms with what the world now is. I can only imagine what it must be like for two people as young as yourselves, especially those who grew up in a town like this, shielded from a lot of the hate and horror that this world has to offer. It's okay, Tobias Sawyer reassured him. You're right, we should be more mindful of the food we take. Good, that was my only intent with my outburst, Tobias acknowledged. While it may look like we have a lot on the shelves, it will go quickly once we have control of our town back. We'll figure out a way, though. Don't you worry, Dylan added optimistically. First things first, though, we have to get up to the school. Where is your vehicle? Tobias inquired. It's around back, Maria replied. We saw that the front doors were open when we pulled in and figured going in the back was the safer option. It wasn't. At least for Tim, who tried to get the front door secured, Dylan interjected. If it's any consolation, he succeeded, Sawyer added with a hint of levity, earning a playful smack from Grayson. Hop in the back, we'll drive you around to your vehicle, Tobias directed. And because we don't know what the situation is at the school, I think we should park at the convenience store to assess. As they loaded up into the vehicle and drove towards the school, Sawyer continued his vigilant search for groupings of creatures, noting three more spots along the way. 
You did really well back there, Sawyer, Tobias commended. Thanks, Tobias. It's my first mass killing, Sawyer replied. Tobias began to turn his head, prompting Sawyer to crack a smile and raise his hand. Sorry, bad jokes are just how I process stress. Like, do you remember two years ago when I broke my leg during a game? I do, actually. Maria looked after you, didn't she? Tobias recalled. She did, putting that first year of nursing school to good use. And you can ask her if you don't believe me, but when I was lying on the field in pain, do you know what the first thing I said to her was? Sawyer recounted. Is it broken? Tobias guessed. Nope. I said, at least I don't have to worry about dancing at the homecoming ball, Sawyer revealed with a chuckle. Tobias cracked a smile, easing the tension as they continued their drive. Soon, they arrived at the convenience store across from the school, which appeared to be devoid of any creatures outside. Despite the apparent lack of immediate threat, they parked near the back of the lot behind the building, opting for caution. From their vantage point, they had a clear view of the school but also some cover. After a moment, Maria pulled up beside them. The school complex wasn't overly large, with a gym and cafeteria on one side to their left, followed by a stretch of hallways and classrooms extending all the way down to the applied learning section where Tobias taught. In this section was his metalworking class and an auto shop housed in a single, spacious room. Security lights cast an eerie glow over the scene outside the school building, despite the storm raging overhead. The illuminated area painted a grim picture. There are only a dozen or so zombies outside near the gym, Sawyer observed, but one of the doors is open, and there's a flood of ghouls going into the building. Oh, that's not good, Tobias remarked. It's okay, Sawyer reassured. The people are in the cafeteria, and they have it blocked off. With what? Tobias questioned. The doors aren't that strong, and there's a lot of them. When we left, they were putting those massive folding tables with the seats up and securing them together, Sawyer explained. They set up a perimeter by the kitchen and storage. At least they were smart enough to lock themselves up with the food, Tobias acknowledged. But the longer we wait, the worse it's going to get. As they pondered their next move, Maria called them on the phone from inside the vehicle, the intensity of the storm making it difficult to communicate through open windows. They've breached the doors, Maria informed them urgently. We see that, Tobias responded, his voice grim. How are we going to get in? Maria inquired. I have an idea, but it's totally dependent on whether or not your fiancé did his job, Tobias explained, gesturing towards Dylan. Of course I did my job. I always do my job, Dylan interjected confidently. So you locked the interior doors of the workshop before leaving the other day? Tobias clarified. There was a long silence on the phone as Dylan contemplated. I honestly don't remember, Dylan admitted. Dylan, this is one of those times where I'm not going to chastise you for forgetting to lock up. I just need you to be truthful, Tobias pressed. I'm being honest, Tobias. I really don't remember, Dylan insisted. Best guess, Tobias prompted. I think we should proceed like they're open, Dylan concluded cautiously. Probably a good idea, Tobias agreed. Tobias surveyed the side of the school, noting the small number of zombies lingering there. He observed the parking lot adjacent to that side, separated from the main one near the gym, with a few cars parked there. What do you think, Sawyer? Do you think you can take out those things from the back of the truck? Tobias queried. Just let me at them. They won't know what hit them, Sawyer replied confidently. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're taking the back entrance to the parking lot, driving slowly to keep the engine noise at a minimum. The storm should provide us with enough cover to get up there without alerting the main mob, Tobias said. What do you want us to do? Grayson asked, eager to contribute. Tobias looked to Sawyer for input, who nodded in agreement. How do you feel about swinging a sword, Grayson? Sawyer inquired. If you can do it, then I'm pretty confident I can do it too, Grayson responded. Then get your butt over here and hop in the back with me, Sawyer instructed with a grin. Sawyer then turned to Tobias, 
placing a hand on the door handle as he outlined their coordination strategy. You get us close, and we'll take them out, Sawyer proposed, gesturing toward the keys in the ignition. Just make sure you have the door key ready. I'd hate to get this soaked only to find we're still locked out, Sawyer added. Tobias glanced down at his keyring, tapping the correct key in confirmation. I'm prepared, but I want you to continue making sure that I am, Tobias affirmed. Sawyer nodded in acknowledgement as he exited the truck, joining Grayson in the back as they both armed themselves with their weapons. Okay, Maria, here we go. Chapter 5 Tobias maneuvered the truck slowly around to the side parking lot entrance, carefully navigating past the cars scattered in the lot. He spotted the handful of zombies by the entrance to the workshop and knocked on the back window to signal Grayson and Sawyer that they were making the final approach. Upon receiving a confirming knock in response, Tobias continued, pulling up to the side of the building about 10 yards away. Despite the driving rain and thunder, the ghouls by the building noticed the sound of the truck's engine and sprinted towards it, where Grayson and Sawyer stood ready with their spears. Tobias shifted the truck into park and observed the confrontation through the rearview and side mirrors, satisfaction evident as the two young men efficiently dispatched the ghouls with precise head strikes. In a matter of minutes, the undead threat was eliminated, leaving Grayson and Sawyer standing in the rain with their weapons at the ready, waiting for any further threats. Sawyer tapped on the roof of the truck as Tobias retrieved his cell phone. Okay, Maria, we're clear here, Tobias reported into the phone. Exiting the truck, Tobias watched as Grayson and Sawyer jumped down, their spears still in hand. Give me a hand with the shield, Grayson, Sawyer requested, prompting Grayson to assist him. I'll get the door ready to open, Tobias announced. As Tobias advanced towards the building and Grayson and Sawyer began extracting the heavy shield from the truck, they caught the distant rumble of Maria's engine. Shortly after, a honk rang out, prompting them to turn their attention towards the approaching vehicle. What the hell is she doing? Grayson exclaimed in surprise. As they turned, they spotted a creature emerging from the side of Maria's vehicle, sprinting straight towards Grayson and Sawyer, only about 15 yards away and closing rapidly. Sawyer acted without hesitation, swiftly grabbing his spear and spinning it around, aiming the point directly at the approaching creature. Instead of aiming for a headshot, he targeted the chest, and the ghoul ran straight into the spear. With the weapon piercing through its body and becoming lodged, Sawyer drove the back of the spear into the ground to help immobilize the creature. Grayson. He called out urgently. Grayson reacted swiftly, seizing his own spear and stepping forward to deliver a decisive strike. With the ghoul held in place, it was an easy kill. As the zombie collapsed to the ground, Sawyer retrieved his spear from the creature's chest, and both men stood at the ready, scanning their surroundings for any further threats. As Maria pulled up, stopping just short of them, she and Dylan exited the vehicle to join them. Are you two okay? Maria inquired with concern. Yeah, we're fine, Sawyer reassured her. Thanks for the heads up, Grayson added. I know we have to be quiet, but I didn't know what else to do, Maria explained. Come on, grab the weapons out of the back. We need to get inside, Sawyer said. Maria and Dylan nodded as Sawyer finished extracting the tower shield from the back of the truck. He hurried over to Tobias, who stood ready at the door, setting the shield down beside them. When I open this, I want you to wedge that thing in there, Tobias instructed. Sawyer nodded, positioning himself and sliding his arm through the strap on the back of the shield. Tobias then silently counted down before turning the key and opening the door halfway, allowing Sawyer to step forward and block the entrance completely with the shield. They waited there for several moments, Sawyer occasionally tapping the shield with his sword to produce a metallic clang. After a full minute passed without any signs of movement or threats in the illuminated room, Sawyer spoke up. I think we're good, he reported. Grayson, when we get inside, I want you and Sawyer to clear the room, Tobias directed. We're on it, Grayson affirmed. Both of them swiftly entered the workshop, weapons at the ready, and began moving through the large space, scanning for any potential dangers. On the left side, they noticed two cars parked in the bays, while several welding stations were set up on the right. 
As they approached the far wall, they were startled by the sudden appearance of a young woman wielding a wrench. Isabel, a tall and fit 17-year-old with a short pixie cut of brown hair, stood up and let out a yell of warning. Get back, assholes, she exclaimed. Sawyer and Grayson halted in their tracks, recognizing her with smiles on their faces. I mean, I know Grayson is a grade-A asshole, but come on, Isabel, I thought we were on better terms than that, Sawyer joked. Isabel took a moment to settle down, as if she were ridding her body of fear and recognizing the familiar faces. Finally, it clicked, and she dropped the wrench, rushing forward to Sawyer and Grayson, embracing them both tightly. Oh my God, it's so good to see you too, she exclaimed. Grayson stepped back, observing the bloodstains on her clothing with concern. Before she could respond, Isabel flinched at the sound of the outer door slamming shut. Spotting the other three, she inquired, Who else is with you? Dylan, Maria, and Tobias, Sawyer replied. Tobias? Isabel questioned. Mr. Walker. Says we're not in school anymore, so he wants to go by Tobias, Sawyer explained. Isabel's face lit up with a smile before she rushed over to Tobias, nearly tackling him with a hug. It took him a moment to recognize her, but he returned the embrace warmly. I am so glad to see you, Isabel expressed. It's good to see you too, Isabel. Always a pleasure to see my best student, Tobias replied. I thought I was your best student. Grayson interjected with a hint of jest, prompting Sawyer to lightly smack him on the arm encouraging him to let Isabel have her moment. The door to the school looks pretty secure, Dylan noted. It is, I made sure of it, Isabel confirmed. How did you even get down here? When we left for the grocery store, you were with the others in the cafeteria, Grayson inquired. Isabel's emotions began to surface, but instead of sadness, anger filled her. I was, but... Some dumbass parent wasn't watching their kid. He couldn't have been more than five or six, and he ran straight for the emergency exit door. A couple of us noticed and ran after him, but he had too much of a head start. He pushed on the release, and all hell broke loose, Isabel explained grimly. She paused again, visibly struggling to compose herself, her gaze distant as if she were reliving the traumatic events in her mind. I was a few steps behind this guy, I don't know who he was but he managed to get his hands on the kid just as he opened the door. I froze, watching him get into a tug of war with one of those things with the kid. My mind said to go help, but my body didn't listen. A split second later, it was over. As those things poured into the cafeteria, Isabel recounted, her voice laden with the weight of the memory. Tobias offered her reassurance, telling her she didn't have to continue, but Isabel insisted, determined to share her story. I'm all right she asserted before continuing. Anyway, I was with this other kid, I think his name was Kevin, underclassman, so I didn't really know him. We turned to run back to the others, but they had already closed the gap with those folding tables. So we did the only thing we could do, which was run to the workshop. I heard him scream from a few steps behind me as I ran. I didn't look back because I knew there was nothing I could do for him. When I got to the door, I looked back up the hallway before shutting it. I could see half a dozen of those things piled up on top of him, I'm pretty sure if it wasn't for him slowing them down, I wouldn't have made it. Tobias, sensing Isabel's growing emotional distress, pulled her close, offering comfort. Let it out, Isabel. Let it out. It's not your fault what happened to Kevin. Isabel stepped back, taking a moment to gather herself before continuing. Thank you, and I know. It just, it's going to stay with me for a while, Isabel admitted, her voice still carrying traces of emotion as it should. But I need you to set that aside because if we don't do something about those abominations that are in the school, a lot more people are going to end up like Kevin, Tobias emphasized, to which Isabel nodded resolutely. Just let me know what you need me to do, she responded. That's my girl, Tobias acknowledged with pride. Meanwhile, Dylan approached the door, peering through the crack to assess the situation in the hallway. He reported back to the group, noting movement inside but a relative absence near the door. What do you see, my love? Maria inquired. It's hard to tell, but there's at least a few dozen of them inside. They've mostly wandered away from the door, though, Dylan relayed. Is someone still in touch with the group up there? Tobias asked. 
I'm still connected, Maria affirmed. Same here. What do you want me to tell them? Sawyer asked. Nothing yet. We need to figure out what we're doing first, Tobias instructed. It's a shame we only have the one tower shield. That has been working like a charm, Sawyer noted. Tobias pondered for a moment before a grin spread across his face. Sawyer, ask them how well their defenses are holding, he directed. Sawyer nodded and followed Tobias' instructions. Meanwhile, Tobias made his way over to the two cars resting in the garage. There were older vehicles, a common sight as they were donated for the kids to learn automotive skills. He approached one of them and wrapped his knuckles against its side, feeling the sturdy material they were made from. They just texted back, said that they're holding for now, but one of the supports is starting to crack, Sawyer informed the group. Good, then we have time, Tobias replied. Time for what, Tobias? Time to make what we need to make in order to purify this school of those abominations, he declared. Isabel approached Tobias, who was still lingering near the cars. She tapped on the front hood of one of them, nodding in approval. That's brilliant, Mr. Walker, she praised. Tobias glanced over at her, and Isabel quickly corrected herself. I'm sorry, Tobias. Sawyer told me. She apologized, realizing her mistake. Sawyer, still puzzled, sought clarification amidst the banter. What's brilliant? I'm lost, he admitted. Grayson couldn't resist adding a teasing remark. Wouldn't be the first time, he quipped. You're one to talk. I've seen you react to a corner blitz, he countered. Isabel, amused by their exchange, intervened to explain. Your shield is too small to do much good in a hallway that big. But the concept is sound, she clarified. Yeah. But we don't have any more shields, he remarked. Isabel smirked confidently. We do actually. Weld these two hoods together, and it will cover most of the hallway, she proposed and when we add the trunks to the sides, it will give us the protection we need, Tobias elaborated. That's going to be heavy as hell, Sawyer added. It's a good thing that there's six of us then, Dylan pointed out. We just need to get it out into the hallway. After that, we're acting as a single unit. Three reinforce it, while the other three strike the abominations down, Tobias said. The group exchanged nods, signaling their agreement with the plan. As they all looked over to Tobias, all he could do was smile. Dylan, get the welders fired up. We have work to do. Chapter 6 Tobias, Dylan, Grayson, and Isabel diligently wielded the welding torches, their efforts focused on connecting car parts to construct a barricade. Meanwhile, Sawyer and Maria observed from a distance, marveling at the seamless teamwork displayed by the quartet. No matter how many times I see Tobias work as magic, it never ceases to amaze me, Maria remarked, her admiration evident in her tone. So you know Tobias well? Sawyer inquired. You could say that, Maria replied. Dylan was actually more nervous about introducing me to him than he was his own parents. He has idolized him ever since he took his metal shop class as a freshman. So much so that he skipped out on college when Tobias offered him an assistant position under him. Skipping out on college just to work at a high school in this nothing of a town? Sawyer questioned incredulously. Dylan's always been. Maria paused momentarily, carefully selecting her words. How do I say this without it sounding bad? Because it isn't. Dylan's always been a small town guy. He doesn't like going out, doesn't like crowds, just likes being home with those he's closest to. There's nothing wrong with being a simple man. Once I get the whole college thing out of my system, I could totally see myself as a simple man, Sawyer remarked thoughtfully. Don't get me wrong, he's very complex. He just doesn't like being around people, Maria clarified. Well, after the story that Isabel told, I can totally understand that, Sawyer conceded, nodding in agreement as the welding torches ceased their crackling. I think that's as good as that's going to get, Tobias, Dylan announced, approaching Tobias for inspection. Tobias examined Dylan's work, offering a nod of approval as he patted him on the shoulder. That should be just fine. But before we purify the town, we're going to need to reinforce it. 
Dylan acknowledged Tobias' instructions, while Grayson gestured for Sawyer to join them in lowering the giant shield from the table. On three. One, two, three, Grayson counted. The group synchronized their efforts, hoisting the barrier down to the floor with ease. Stepping back, they admired their handiwork. The barrier spanned eight feet across, with a slight angle in the middle, adding to its fortification. Eight handholds adorned its backside, strategically placed at varying heights for optimal grip. Sawyer approached the barrier, giving it a solid push and nodding in approval as it remained steadfast. That's pretty darn solid there, he remarked. Even so, we still need to protect our flank, because there's a lot of those things out there, and this isn't going to go all the way across the hall. Isabel pointed out, her gaze shifting to a pair of car doors on the floor, modified with metal bars over the window opening and arm straps attached. I know I play football, Isabel, but I ain't no linebacker. How do you expect me to hold that up? Sawyer questioned, skepticism lacing his tone. Well, I know you're not a linebacker, which is why I made some adjustments. Come give it a try, Isabel replied confidently. Sawyer nodded, stretching before positioning himself next to the car door. He slid his arm through the straps, securing a firm grip before attempting to lift it. To his surprise, he found the door remarkably light, easily raising it with one arm, despite his initial doubts. What in the world? Sawyer exclaimed, astonished by the door's unexpected weightlessness. I figured that we don't need the door to protect against impact, at least not the type of impact from getting hit with another car. We just needed to hold those things at bay for a minute. So I stripped out all of the interior mechanics, leaving the light metal exterior, Isabel explained. Sawyer nodded as Grayson and Tobias approached. Grayson effortlessly lifted his door, mirroring Sawyer's feet with ease. That's some fine work there, Isabel, Grayson praised. Thank you. I figure you're going to be protecting my flank, so I went the extra mile to make sure you don't get tired, Isabel replied. When we go out there, boys, it's on you to hold them at the sides. Dylan and Maria will be holding the main defenses in place, you two at the sides, while Isabel and I destroy the abominations, Tobias directed, his voice commanding. And don't worry, as soon as we see one coming around the side towards you, they immediately become the priority, so you won't have to hold them in place for long. Isabel reassured, her confidence unwavering. What do you say, Grayson? Ready to play a little defense, Sawyer quipped, prompting a smirk from Grayson. If you can do it, then how hard can it be? Grayson replied, his smirk widening as Sawyer chuckled at the jest at his expense. Okay, everyone, the time has come to purify this place. Let's get ready, Tobias announced, rallying the group into battle mode. With purpose, they moved the large barricade over to the door, Dylan handling the lock with care to avoid making noise, not wanting to alert the nearby creatures. The group fell silent, attuned to the distant sounds of zombies in the hallway, their anticipation mounting. Maria pulled out her phone, a plan forming in her mind. I'm going to tell them to make noise up there for 30 seconds. That should give us enough time to set up. Tobias interjected. Tell them to only do it if they're 100% certain their fortifications will hold. Maria nodded, quickly sending the message. The group waited in tense anticipation until Maria's phone buzzed with a reply. She nodded in confirmation. They said that they're starting in just a few seconds. The group stood poised by the door, their senses heightened, awaiting the signal. Suddenly, a cacophony of screams and banging erupted from the far end of the hallway. Dylan peered through the gap in the door observing the horde of zombies rushing towards the cafeteria. We're good. Let's move. Dylan yelled, urgency driving their actions. He flung open the door, and together, they swiftly maneuvered the barricade into the hallway. Grayson and Sawyer quickly joined them, taking up positions on either side. As the barricade dropped to the ground, a metallic clang reverberated, drawing the attention of the approaching zombies. With eager anticipation, the ghouls hastened towards them. Dylan and Maria knelt behind the barricade, bracing themselves against the impending onslaught, while Tobias and Isabel readied their spears. As the first ghoul approached, Tobias struck with lethal precision, his spear piercing the creature's skull with deadly accuracy. The zombie convulsed briefly before collapsing. The next one is yours, Isabel. 
Thrust as hard as you can and aim for the nose, Tobias instructed, his voice unwavering. Isabel nodded, focusing on her target a youthful zombie reminiscent of her own age. Summoning her resolve, she stepped forward and thrust the spear with all her might. Her aim was true, the spear penetrating the creature's forehead. A gasp escaped Isabel as she recognized the familiar face of Kevin. Sensing her hesitation, Tobias intervened, forcefully guiding her hand to retrieve the spear. The lifeless body slumped to the ground, leaving Isabel visibly shaken. They're not people anymore, Isabel. They're abominations and must be struck down. Now keep fighting, Tobias commanded. Isabel nodded as she braced herself for the next creature, part of a pack of three just ahead of a looming mob. With practice precision, both she and Tobias delivered kill shots as the ghouls reached the barricade, swiftly readjusting their aim towards the approaching horde. In the ensuing chaos, the ghouls pounded against the barricade, their frenzied assault striking Dylan and Maria as they struggled to maintain its defense. From the edge, Sawyer watched intently as Tobias and Isabel dispatched half a dozen creatures in rapid succession, only to witness another twenty closing in. He remained focused, tracking their movements, and hoped they would align with the advancing horde. But his prayers went unanswered as two of them broke from the pack, fixating on him and charging forward. Sawyer assumed a defensive crouch, bracing for impact as he held the door aloft. The creatures collided with him simultaneously, the force of their assault nearly knocking him off balance. With a grunt, Sawyer maintained his stance, his football honed strength preventing him from faltering. But as he strained under their weight, he glimpsed a third creature bearing down on him through the bars. Isabel, he called out urgently. Isabel turned and saw Sawyer's predicament springing into action. Without hesitation, she turned and plunged her spear into the creature just behind the lead one, the blade piercing the side of its head. As it crumpled to the ground, the next ghoul in line advanced, but Isabel remained undeterred, swiftly dispatching it as well. However, as she retrieved her spear, it slipped from her grasp, clattering on the edge of the barricade and drawing the attention of another ghoul. The creature lunged towards Isabel, its flailing arms momentarily knocking the spear from her hands. Seizing the opportunity, Sawyer drew his sword and thrust it through the bars, striking the ghoul in the head and sending it crashing to the ground. As Isabel retrieved her spear, she exchanged a nod of acknowledgement with Sawyer. The battle in the hallway raged on, with the group valiantly fending off a horde of thirty creatures. The next few tense-filled minutes were a blur of blades and blood. Spears and swords cracking skulls, creatures dropping to the ground only to be replaced in line by the next one. But soon, the mob thinned, leaving only a scant few that were dispatched by well-aimed thrusts by Tobias and Isabel. Just when they believed they had vanquished them all, they observed another zombie sprinting down the hallway. The creature stumbled and fell flat on its face, just a couple of feet from the barricade. Tobias swiftly ended its threat with a well-placed stab to the back of its head. I think that's got it. Grayson remarked, a sense of relief evident in his voice. However, the group remained puzzled as they continued to hear moaning and screaming from the far end of the hallway. If we've got them all, then what in the world is that? Dylan questioned. Stragglers, maybe? Sawyer suggested. Just then, Maria's phone vibrated. She hastily retrieved it and read the message, her expression turning grim. What is it, honey? Dylan inquired anxiously. It's Principal Harris. He said that their defenses failed. Chapter 7 the group stood in the hallway, stunned by the news Maria had just delivered. Sensing the urgency of the situation, Tobias barked out orders in a commanding tone, jolting everyone into action. Grace and Sawyer on me now. The rest of you, start moving that barricade up the hallway, Tobias directed, his voice cutting through the tension. As Tobias, Grayson, and Sawyer sprinted towards the cafeteria, Dylan called out, his worry palpable. Tobias. It's in the Lord's hands now. Boys, come on, Tobias replied. Leading the way, Tobias spurred the group into action, despite the uneasy exchange between Grayson and Sawyer at his mention of the Lord. Despite their apprehension, they knew the urgency of the situation and the need for immediate action. 
Halfway up the hallway, two zombies spotted them and charged in their direction. The leader surged ahead, presenting Tobias with an opportunity. Stepping forward, he planted his foot and thrust his spear with precision, dispatching the ghoul like a seasoned warrior on the battlefield. As Tobias withdrew his weapon, Sawyer rushed forward with his makeshift shield, moving to his right. The ghoul, focused on Tobias, was caught off guard as Sawyer struck from the side. With a forceful blow, Sawyer knocked the creature off balance, sending it crashing to the ground. Before it could recover, Grayson stepped in, using his shield to deliver the finishing blow, ending the threat decisively. Teamwork, boys. That's how we're going to survive this. Teamwork, Tobias emphasized. Both football players nodded at Tobias as the trio continued running towards the cafeteria. They stopped at the end of the hallway, assessing the scene before them before rushing into action. To their left, the open door still had a few creatures attempting to enter, hindered by a small body blocking its closure. To their right, the cafeteria presented a barricade of large folding tables, with a small gap between two of them where ten creatures struggled to break through. Sawyer quickly dropped to the ground, peering under the tables to assess the situation. They're not in the kitchen yet, he reported. Then we have to assume that the people are safe for the moment, so we have time to act, Tobias reasoned. I don't know about you two, but I want to make sure that door is closed before we do anything. It's going to be hard enough fighting these things when they're not coming at us from all sides, Grayson asserted. Tobias surveyed the scene, noting the creatures near the door and the one attempting to enter. Okay, we move to the door first. I want the two of you to knock back the ones by the door. Don't worry about eliminating them, I just need them out of the way so I can secure the building. The two men with shields nodded, readying their doors as Tobias set his spear aside, drawing his short sword instead. With a nod, the trio set off. Moving swiftly but quietly across the floor, Tobias let the shielded men lead the way. While they focused on the threats by the door, Tobias fixed his gaze on the ghouls by the tables. As they neared the doors, Sawyer whispered urgently, Break for them, now. Both Sawyer and Grayson sprinted ahead, their makeshift shields held high, drawing the attention of the nearby ghouls. By the time the creatures realized fresh prey was near, they were swiftly incapacitated by the shields at the hands of Sawyer and Grayson. Instead of delivering kill shots, the two men planted their shields firmly in the chests of the ghouls, holding them down while Tobias rushed over to the door. As he approached, a zombie managed to get inside, stumbling over the smaller corpse in the doorway. Without hesitation, Tobias thrust his sword upwards, driving it into the bottom of the zombie's skull. With a convulsive shudder, the ghoul collapsed to the ground as Tobias swiftly moved to yank the small corpse inside. As the door began to shut, he glanced outside, seeing a horde of creatures milling about in the rain. Breathing a sigh of relief when none of them spotted him, Tobias turned back to the boys, but his attention was drawn by faint sounds coming from the corpse he had pulled inside. Tobias's heart sank as he realized the zombified remains belonged to the young boy Isabel had spoken of. Too damaged to pose a threat, the creature could do little more than emit a half-hearted moan and twitch. Falling to his knees, Tobias gazed upward with a mix of anguish and anger. This is your will, Lord. What did this boy do to deserve this fate? He questioned bitterly. Taking a moment to compose himself, Tobias raised his sword above his head. Whatever your rationale, it is my duty to rid this world of these abominations. That much is clear, he declared resolutely. With a swift, decisive motion, Tobias stabbed downward, mercifully ending the creature's suffering. It took him a moment to recalibrate after the ordeal, prompting concern from Grayson and Sawyer. You know him better than I do. Is that normal? Sawyer asked. Grayson gestured towards the zombies they had pinned to the ground. Can't be any more abnormal than pinning these things to the ground with a 30-year-old car door, he remarked wryly. Sawyer pondered for a moment before nodding in agreement. Soon after, Tobias returned to his usual self. He rose to his feet, casually walking over to the pinned down creatures and delivering forceful headshots to each of them. As Grayson and Sawyer stood back up, Taking a brief moment to stretch out their muscles, they all turned towards the last remaining threat inside, the mob by the kitchen. Let us finish this, Tobias declared. Grayson and Sawyer nodded as they readied their shields, taking the lead as they approached the mob of creatures, 
numbering around a dozen. Two ghouls pressed against the opening between the tables, unaware of their impending doom. With swift, precise movements, Tobias swung his sword, slicing through the back of their heads and dropping them both to the ground. Tobias began to issue an order, but both Sawyer and Grayson understood what needed to be done. They rushed forward, each taking a side of the opening and thrusting their shields into it, forming a barrier. Lowering themselves, they positioned for a clear line of sight to the creature's heads, none of whom had yet noticed their presence. Tobias nodded as he retrieved his spear and approached the opening. Looking down at Sawyer and Grayson, both of whom signaled their readiness, he let out a deafening whistle. Several zombies near the back of the pack turned and rushed towards Tobias, only to collide with the doors held firmly in place by the boys. Tobias lined up his shot, delivering a precise blow straight to the forehead of the first ghoul, dropping it to the ground. Another quickly took its place, meeting the same fate. It was a gruesome plan that took a couple of minutes to unfold, but it worked like a charm. The trio stood amidst the aftermath, their chests heaving with exertion and adrenaline still coursing through their veins. Tobias, with methodical precision, had dispatched the ghouls one by one, bringing an end to the immediate threat. As the last of the undead fell, they took a collective moment to ensure that all was truly quiet and dead. Their brief respite was shattered by a heavy clanging sound echoing from the hallway. All three of them turned in unison, witnessing the other three struggling to pull up the barricade. Dylan managed a half-hearted wave as he caught his breath. Tobias's gaze drifted towards the still-closed kitchen door. He gestured for Sawyer and Grayson to follow him, and together they cautiously approached, stepping over the fallen ghouls littering the ground. With the shutters closed, they had no visual access to the interior. They listened intently, hearing nothing but faint murmuring. Tobias shrugged before lightly rapping on the door. A voice responded from within. Who's there? The voice called out. Tobias Walker, and my friends, Tobias replied. After a moment, the door began to unlock and swung open to reveal Principal Harris. The older man, drenched in blood, stood there with a mix of relief and exhaustion on his face. Tobias, thank God you're alive, Harris breathed. Harris glanced past Tobias and spotted Grayson and Sawyer standing there, their shields stained with blood. They offered him a half-hearted wave. Hey, Principal Harris, Grayson greeted. You doing okay in there? Sawyer inquired. Hey boys, is Mr. Walker here taking care of you? Principal Harris asked. No doubt. Tobias saved my life earlier tonight, Sawyer affirmed. And from the looks of it, he saved yours as well, Grayson added. Principal Harris nodded in acknowledgement and began to step out of the kitchen. However, his gaze fell upon the mass of bodies on the ground, and he looked like he might be sick. Despite his discomfort, he did his best to hold himself together. Oh, that is just vile. I don't know if I can look at that, Harris remarked. Tobias's response was firm. You're going to have to, Harris, because this is the world we live in now. Harris took a moment to collect himself, drawing upon some inner reserve of strength before addressing Tobias once more. Okay, Tobias, I can handle this, but there are a lot of people in here who can't. They don't need to see this, especially the kids, Harris stated with a tone of concern. Tobias met his gaze squarely, asserting, the sooner these people confront the new world, the sooner we can get to purifying it. However, Harris disagreed. No, Tobias. These people have been traumatized enough. They don't need to see this. This may be the new world, but they don't have to be bombarded by it today, he insisted. Sawyer interjected, considering Harris's perspective. Maybe he's right, Tobias. We're going to have to clean this up anyway. Let them have their innocence for another night. After a moment of contemplation, Tobias reluctantly relented. Very well, Harris, but you're helping to clean up the mess. Harris grimaced at the thought, but eventually nodded, emerging from the kitchen. He paused before shutting the door, addressing the assembled survivors. Okay, everybody, we have to do a sweep of the building to make sure it's secure. I want everyone to stay inside until we come and get you, he instructed before closing and securing the door. Observing Harris's actions, Tobias shook his head disapprovingly. 
Lying to people is not a good look, Harris. Harris defended himself, stating, I'm just protecting them. Tobias countered firmly, if they're going to survive, they need truth, not protection. Grayson offered reassurance, don't worry, Tobias, they're going to get their truth when the sun comes up. Intrigued, Harris inquired, how do you figure, Grayson? Because we still have to clear out the things that are outside, and I have an idea. Chapter 8 Tobias, Grayson, and Principal Harris stood to the side of the lunchroom as the rest of the group moved bodies from outside the kitchen into a classroom. Okay, Grayson, the floor is yours. What's your idea? Tobias inquired. Well, those things can't climb, right? Grayson began, prompting Tobias to nod in agreement. We have yet to see it happen, and furthermore, none of the people I have spoken to have seen it happen. So that is a safe assumption. Okay, so look around at the windows in this place. Not a single one of them is lower than chest high, Grayson pointed out. Tobias and Principal Harris surveyed the lunchroom, noting the wall's height and the row of windows above it. So what? Principal Harris questioned. Well, we have a couple of spears, so why not pull those things outside over to the windows and take them down? There's virtually no risk to us, and all we have to do is make some noise, Grayson proposed. Tobias grinned approvingly, placing his hand on Grayson's shoulder. That is an excellent idea, son. That's the sort of thinking we need. I want you to start making preparations. Get some chain, lock up those doors to make sure they can't open. No, no way this is happening, Harris interjected, but Tobias disregarded his objection. I want you to pick five spots, make sure that the windows open, but don't open them just yet. Find some flashlights as well, because we're going to need to see what we're aiming for. Tobias instructed Grayson, ignoring Harris's protests once again. Grayson, however, had a question. Why five spots? We only have two spears, don't we? At the moment, we do. But we also have a fully functional workshop just down the hallway, Tobias revealed with a confident smile. Grayson nodded, understanding the plan. I'll make sure we're ready to go, Tobias. Good boy, Tobias praised. Tobias patted Grayson on the shoulder as he walked away. Principal Harris stood there for a moment, staring at Tobias with increasing frustration as he continued to be ignored. After a few steps, Harris began following Tobias, raising his voice. Tobias Walker, you need to stop what you're doing right now. I am not going to allow you to enact your plan and endanger the people who are under my care. Harris shouted, trying to get Tobias' attention. But Tobias remained focused, walking over to Dylan who was emerging from a classroom filled with corpses. Dylan, I need you, Tobias called out. What is it, Tobias? Dylan responded. We're going to need spears. We only have two right now, and we're going to need to fashion at least five, hopefully seven or eight. I'm not worried about my crafted ones faltering, but we're not going to have the time we need to refine these, so they may break, Tobias explained. I'm on it, Tobias, Dylan replied. As they stood there, Harris approached, still visibly upset. However, before he could speak, the stench from the nearby classroom overwhelmed him, causing him to gag and nearly fall to the ground. Tobias looked at him with disdain as Harris struggled with the smell. Now, you had something you wanted to discuss with me, Harris? Tobias asked, his tone cutting through the discomfort. But Harris was unable to speak, still grappling with the nausea induced by the odor. Finally, Tobias took action, grabbing Harris by the arm and dragging him across the hall into an empty classroom. Once inside, Tobias positioned himself in front of the door like a guard, arms crossed, as he waited for Harris to regain his composure. When Harris finally managed to compose himself enough to speak, he voiced his objections. This is not your school, Tobias, and I forbid you from doing what you're about to do. Tobias stared him down for a moment before striding menacingly toward him causing Harris to recoil in fear. Tobias grabbed the principal by the arm and forcefully directed him toward the window. Look outside, Tobias commanded. The scene outside was illuminated by a bolt of lightning, casting an eerie glow over the parking lot. Fifty zombies roamed about, some attempting to breach the doors without success. Look out there, Harris. What do you see? Tobias demanded. I. 
I don't know what they are, Harris replied, his voice filled with uncertainty. They're abominations, Harris. They have no souls. The people they once were are gone. If we do not exterminate them, they will exterminate us. Do you understand? Tobias explained firmly. Harris gazed out at the creatures, a sense of sadness overtaking him. I know you're right, but what you're suggesting is dangerous. We should be coming up with a plan to lure those things away from here, not fight them at our windows, he argued. On the contrary, Harris, what we're doing is the safest thing we can possibly do, Tobias countered. Still uncertain, Harris struggled to find a rebuttal, ultimately dropping his head in defeat. Okay, Tobias, we'll do it your way, he conceded. Good man. Now I need the keys to the office, Tobias requested. Harris complied, handing over his keys, but then paused with concern. Wait, why do you need the office keys? Because that's where the switch for the weather alarm is, Tobias replied matter-of-factly as he turned to leave the room. Harris's eyes widened in realization, and he began to protest vehemently, running after Tobias. You're out of your goddamn mind. Tobias's demeanor shifted from calm to aggressive in an instant. He grabbed Harris by the throat and shoved him against the wall, his voice low and menacing. You would be wise to mind your tongue around me, Harris. Do not speak the Lord's name in that manner. Do we understand each other? Harris managed to eke out a yes, prompting Tobias to release his grip. He then leaned in close, whispering into Harris's ear. Something you need to remember, Harris. The old world is gone. There is no union or school board that will protect you. The only protection you have is yourself and those in your corner. Remember that when you speak, Tobias cautioned. With a pat on the shoulder, Tobias walked out of the classroom. Harris coughed, still recovering from the encounter, and slunk down to the floor, feeling helpless in the face of the unfolding events. As Tobias emerged from the classroom, Isabel and Maria approached him. Is everything okay, Tobias? Maria inquired. It's fine, Maria. I was just having a word with the principal, making sure that we were on the same page, Tobias reassured them, though they could sense there was more to it. Well, we have all the bodies squared away. What's next? Isabel asked. I want you to get down to the workshop and help Dylan fashion some spears. They don't need to be fancy, just something that can withstand some headshots, Tobias instructed. I'll make us something good, Isabel affirmed. I have no doubt that you will, Tobias replied with confidence. As Isabel dashed off, Tobias and Maria began walking towards the office. Maria noticed the expression on Tobias's face, sensing a mixture of stoicism, pain, and stress. Tobias? Maria spoke up. Yes, Maria? Tobias responded. I know we haven't known each other as long as you and Dylan have known each other. But I'd like to think we've grown close over the last couple of years, Maria started. I consider you the daughter I never had. Dylan couldn't have picked a better partner, Tobias replied warmly. Maria smiled appreciatively. I'm glad to hear you say that, because I want you to know that you can come to me in confidence and talk to me about anything. Tobias stopped, turning to Maria with a curious glance. Maria continued, a bit nervous. I hope that I'm not out of line. But I know that you and Carrie were each other's support, that you got each other through tough times. That is true, she was my rock, Tobias acknowledged and I'm not looking to replace her. I just know that sometimes it's easier to talk to a woman about things than a man you're close to, Maria explained, gesturing towards Grayson and Sawyer, who were practicing spear thrusts and bantering with each other. Or the literal children that we're relying on for our survival, Tobias added with a chuckle, appreciating Maria's perspective. I'm not saying that you have to talk to me, only that it's an option, Maria reassured him. Tobias nodded, placing his hand on her shoulder. It is very much appreciated, Maria. I can see why Dylan picked you. I may take you up on that one day. Anytime you need me, Maria promised. Right now, I could really use your help in getting those two boys focused on the fight that's headed our way, Tobias requested. Consider it done, Maria affirmed. As Tobias walked off, Maria headed to work on refocusing Grayson and Sawyer. 
Meanwhile, Tobias made his way towards the office, located at the far end of the cafeteria. He unlocked the door and entered, eyeing the lone glowing light of the emergency battery-operated intercom system. He approached the system, grasping the microphone and activating it. The speakers throughout the building crackled to life, signaling Tobias's address to the survivors. Good evening, everyone, Tobias began, his voice carrying authority and conviction. For those who do not know me, my name is Tobias Walker. For the last 30 plus years, I have been the metal shop teacher in this very school. Now, however, I have a much more important job, which is to purify this land of the abominations that are fighting to rob us of our very existence. He let his words hang in the air for a moment before continuing, emphasizing the gravity of their situation. While we have successfully ended the threat of the creatures inside the school, well over a hundred of them still remain outside. Which is why, in just a few minutes, I am going to trigger the weather alarm. Another pause, allowing his message to sink in. For decades, it has warned us of when a storm was on the horizon. Tonight, however, it is sending a signal to those things outside that want our destruction, that we are the storm, and we are here. Now, you are safe in the kitchen, which is where I want you all to remain until this passes. Tobias took another moment's pause. I know you have been through a lot, and that you are scared. But fear not, because we are the warriors of God, and we will win this night. With a final click, Tobias deactivated the intercom, preparing to trigger the weather alarm. He steeled himself, then flipped the switch, unleashing the deafening alarm that signaled their defiance against the encroaching threat. Chapter 9 As the blaring siren pierced the night air, Tobias emerged from the office, his gait relaxed as he made his way toward Grayson and Sawyer stationed by the windows, their spears at the ready. Outside, a small horde of zombies pressed against the glass, eager to breach the building's defenses. Grayson, Sawyer, start doing your thing Tobias instructed. With synchronized nods, the two boys approached their respective windows, each faced with a pair of undead assailants. You ready? Sawyer inquired. Depends. Are we keeping score? Grayson retorted with a hint of banter. Of course we're keeping score, Sawyer affirmed. In what universe are we not keeping score? It's a new world, Sawyer, Grayson quipped, so the slate has been wiped clean. I just wanted to make sure you were prepared to be a loser in this one, too. Sawyer shook his head, a faint grin tugging at his lips, before activating the window release. Moments later, Grayson followed suit, the windows crashing inward with a resounding thud. Undeterred, the zombies lunged through the openings, their grasping hands falling short. Stepping back to a nearby table, the duo illuminated the area with their flashlights, exchanging a nod of readiness before engaging the encroaching undead. With practice precision, they dispatched the first wave before regrouping for the next onslaught. Meanwhile, Tobias observed their efforts with a sense of paternal pride, likening it to them starting their first varsity game. As he moved down the row of windows, he approached Maria, who stood vigilant beside a flashlight. Before he could reach her, Isabel and Dylan emerged from the workshop, each armed with a handful of makeshift spears. They're not perfect, Dylan remarked, but they should get the job done. Tobias seized one of the makeshift weapons, a jagged piece of scrap metal affixed to rebar with hurried welding. He examined it closely, tapping its tip against the floor before nodding in approval. That's good work, you two, he commended Isabel and Dylan. These will do nicely. But his attention swiftly shifted as Maria's urgent call drew everyone's gaze to the windows. Outside, a throng of undead creatures relentlessly pounded against the glass. Without hesitation, Tobias took charge, snatching the pile of spears from Dylan's hands. Isabel, give one of these to Maria, then join the line, he directed. We're going to need your help. Turning to Dylan, he instructed, I want you back in the shop. Make a few more of these just to be on the safe side. With a nod, Dylan hurried down the hallway, leaving Tobias to approach the window, his own flashlight casting an illuminating beam on the scene outside. As he faced the creatures, a mix of pity and rage surged within Tobias. You have taken so much from us, but no more, he declared, his voice carrying a quiet intensity. You are at your end. With resolve, 
Tobias flung open the window, barely avoiding the grasping hands of the ghouls. Instead of engaging in battle, he merely watched them, as if seeking to understand their nature. After a momentary trance, Tobias snapped back to action. Without a battle cry, he stepped forward and delivered a decisive blow to the nearest creature. His swift action spurred Maria and Isabel into action, and soon they joined in the assault, dispatching the undead with practiced efficiency. Throughout the night, the group of six operated like a well-oiled machine, fending off every ghoul drawn by the noise and light. As dawn approached, the flow of attackers dwindled to a trickle, until finally, there were none left. Surveying the aftermath in the dim light of morning, the group witnessed a scene both harrowing and awe-inspiring. Over a hundred undead lay strewn around the school's perimeter, a grim testament to their resilience. Though they had survived the night, a profound sadness lingered. This once tight-knit community had been irrevocably shattered in the recent days. We haven't seen any of them in almost an hour, Sawyer remarked, breaking the somber silence. I think we can turn the alarm off. Tobias contemplated for a moment before giving a decisive nod, prompting Sawyer to dart towards the office. The group lingered in silence, a collective relief washing over them as the blaring alarm ceased. Oh, that's a lot better, Grayson remarked, breaking the quiet tension. I'm still going to be hearing that for a few hours, Dylan added, his expression weary. As Sawyer returned, Tobias addressed the group, his tone a mixture of pride and determination. This has been a fantastic start to our mission, he began. We've taken a big step towards purifying our town of these abominations, but there's still much work ahead. I need one volunteer to ride with me. Isabel eagerly raised her hand, eliciting a smile and nod from Tobias. Very well, he acknowledged. Maria interjected, curiosity coloring her voice. Where are you off to? We're going to do a quick drive through of the town, Make sure that we have indeed ended the immediate threat, Tobias explained. Dylan piped up, eager to assist. What do you want us to get working on next? Self-care, Tobias replied firmly. We've all had a long, sleepless night, so I want you all to get some rest. Two hours of sleep followed by a hearty breakfast will carry us through the day. With unanimous agreement, Tobias and Isabel made their way towards the workshop, each grabbing a sword before stepping outside unwilling to venture unarmed. Tobias treaded cautiously as he exited the building, scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger. Satisfied that the coast was clear, he motioned for Isabel to follow as they climbed into the truck and began their slow journey through the town. When you look for those things, be mindful of the windows, Tobias advised. The windows? Isabel questioned, puzzled. We have to assume that some people may not have made it outside before their souls left their bodies, Tobias explained solemnly. Isabel pondered the question for a moment before nodding in agreement. They drove in relative silence for several minutes before Isabel broke the quiet. Tobias? Yes, Isabel? Tobias responded, his attention focused on the road ahead. Do you know what we're going to do now? And I don't just mean clear the town. I mean, what are we going to do about food? About other people who may show up? Tobias considered her question carefully before replying, his voice measured yet thoughtful. That is an excellent question, Isabel, and one I will ponder while we survey the town. Danger still lurks here, and if we look ahead, we might just miss something. Isabel nodded in understanding as they continued their journey through the deserted streets. Although the immediate threat seemed to have been quelled, Isabel couldn't shake the sense of unease lingering in the air. As they drove on, Isabel noticed movement in a few of the houses they passed. It was unclear whether the inhabitants were alive or undead, but it was a sign that further investigation was warranted. Meanwhile, hours later, Dylan stirred from his nap in the workshop, spotting Tobias seated at his desk. Stretching to alleviate the stiffness in his muscles, Dylan approached Tobias, who appeared engrossed in his work. Did you get any sleep? Dylan inquired, his tone laced with mild concern. Tobias glanced up, a hint of weariness in his eyes. I had too many things on my mind. Dylan smirked knowingly as he pulled up a chair beside Tobias, glancing at the papers spread out on the desk. 
Among them was a crude map of the town, marked with various annotations. What are you working on? Dylan asked. His curiosity piqued. It was something Isabel said as we were surveying the town, Tobias explained. We need to start thinking long term. Dylan nodded, understanding dawning on him. Figuring out food supplies and defenses. I know we're a good 30 miles from the closest thing resembling civilization, but we have to be prepared for visitors. Tobias pointed emphatically to the intersection to the north, marking it with a giant X. Yes, defenses are important while we prepare ourselves, he affirmed. Dylan regarded Tobias with a mixture of curiosity and concern. What do you mean, Tobias? Prepare ourselves for what? Tobias drew in a deep breath, the gravity of his words weighing heavily upon him. Last night, after I... After I put down the abomination that Carrie had become, he began, his voice laden with emotion, I stood in my kitchen, knife against my wrist, ready to end it all and be with her. But the Lord gave me a purpose, and it is to purify this land. Dylan listened intently, his expression somber as Tobias continued. And we're doing that, Tobias. The town is nearly clear, Dylan interjected, attempting to offer reassurance. Tobias shook his head slightly. I don't believe my purpose. No, our purpose is to just cleanse our town. We have power, Dylan. Knowledge and most importantly, the will to do what is necessary. When we are prepared, we are going to march out from this town and purify every inch of land that touches our feet. Dylan absorbed Tobias's words, his thoughts racing as he grappled with the magnitude of their mission. Okay, Tobias, I'm with you, Dylan declared after a moment his resolve firm. And you know that Maria is with you too. But what if the other people don't believe in our mission? We will make them believe, Tobias replied, his tone resolute. Dylan furrowed his brow, contemplating the challenge ahead. How? Most of these people don't have the faith that we do. We will give them purpose and hope, Tobias asserted, his conviction unwavering. But how do we do that? They're frightened, and our words will fall on their deaf ears, Dylan reasoned. Tobias pointed to the southern road out of town, leading to a place called Chokoloski, situated at the very southern tip of the state, near the water. We will exterminate the abominations here, save the survivors who are cowering in their homes. And this is how we will provide for our flock, Tobias declared, his tone resolute. Dylan regarded Tobias with renewed curiosity as he absorbed the plan. I have spoken with a number of boaters who are floating just off the coast. They have no place to go, but we will give them a place. And in exchange for a safe port, they will provide us with sustenance from the sea, Tobias explained. Dylan nodded in understanding, gradually warming up to the idea. Okay, now the question is, how are we going to take care of Chokoluski? Dylan inquired. Tobias smiled knowingly retrieving some crude drawings from beneath the map and passing them over to Dylan. They depicted a sturdier version of the barricade they had used in the hallway. That's going to take a while to construct, Dylan remarked, eyeing the drawings. It's okay, because we're going to need some time to train a few people, Tobias replied confidently. How many people are you thinking? Dylan questioned. Two teams of ten should do it, Tobias replied without hesitation. I should be able to scrounge up the necessary people from the kitchen. I don't know who all is in there, but I saw a handful of able-bodied men and women, Dylan offered. Good, go recruit who you can, and I will begin figuring out our material, Tobias instructed. Do you want me to wake up the others? Dylan asked. Not yet. Let them rest a little while longer. The next few days will be the hardest of their lives, and they will need their energy, Tobias replied thoughtfully. Dylan nodded in agreement before expressing his unwavering support. Tobias? Yes, Dylan? I have the utmost faith in you, my friend. Whatever you require of me, I will do. Maria too, Dylan affirmed. Tobias grinned appreciatively. Thank you, my friend. Now go. There is much to get done. As Dylan departed to recruit new members, Tobias focused on his drawings jotting down notes in the margins. This is going to work, he murmured to himself, 
confidence radiating in his voice. Chapter 10 Two days later, as the sun rose over the small community of Chokoloski, situated four miles south of Everglades City, the scene mirrored that of its sister community to the north, a rough existence in the midst of the apocalypse. Zombies roamed the streets freely, the neighborhoods almost entirely devoid of life, save for the trapped survivors barricaded in their homes. Half of these neighborhoods bordered the coast, their docks now eerily vacant. On the lone road leading north, four pickup trucks traversed through the heart of the community, skillfully bypassing the undead roaming the streets. Their occupants paid little heed to the zombies, their focus fixed on a singular objective. Finally, the convoy came to a halt at the center of the neighborhoods, the main intersection dividing the community into four sections. A few zombies lurked nearby, but they were swiftly dispatched by Grayson and Sawyer, who leapt out of the trucks wielding short swords. Surveying the area, they observed dozens of creatures within a few blocks, though most moved at a considerably slower pace than before. Now we're talking. Just like that last one we found last night, Grayson remarked, a note of satisfaction in his voice. Even if they are slower, they're still dangerous. So stay alert, Sawyer cautioned, his eyes scanning the surroundings. Grayson nodded in agreement as they turned their attention back to the trucks. In the back were eight large barricades crafted from fused together car hoods. The occupants wasted no time in unloading the heavy metal barriers into the street. Tobias emerged from one of the trucks, his gaze sweeping over the scene with pride as he issued commands. We need to move, just like we practiced. There is no room for error. You can do this. His voice rang out. With practice precision, the group swiftly moved into position, setting up two distinct squares on either side of the intersection. One group positioned themselves on the left, while the other took their place on the right. As the barricades were secured, Tobias and Dylan armed themselves with spears, while Sawyer and Grayson exchanged their swords for longer weapons, ensuring they had plenty of spares. Okay, boys, you know what to do, Tobias declared. The two football players nodded in acknowledgement, making their way to the makeshift fortress on the right side of the intersection. They were welcomed inside, where spare spears were laid out on the ground. Surveying the eight individuals manning the barricades, they noted the precautions taken, kneeling on gym mats to cushion their knees and wearing hard hats for protection. With a glance towards Tobias and Dylan, who were stationed at their own barricade, Sawyer and Grayson received a reassuring nod, signaling their readiness. Here we go, people, Tobias announced, reaching into a small bag and retrieving a boat horn. He pressed down on the top, unleashing a deafening blast that reverberated through the air. The blaring sound continued for a solid minute before the canister was emptied and discarded. Tobias and Dylan readied their spears, anticipation building as they awaited the approaching horde of zombies. As the first wave of ghouls approached, Tobias and his companions watched with steely determination. When the creatures drew within five yards, Tobias struck, delivering a precise blow that sent the nearest one crashing to the ground. Over the next few minutes, the initial wave pressed against the barricades in a relentless onslaught, covering every inch of open space. Inside, the defenders dug in, ensuring the barricades held firm against them. The four armed men inside moved with methodical efficiency, stabbing down the line and delivering kill shot after kill shot. Despite the gruesome task at hand, there was no panic, just a grim resolve to do what needed to be done. After a grueling 15 minutes, the first wave was vanquished, but a larger mob still loomed on the horizon, emerging from the neighborhoods. Is everybody good? Tobias called out, his voice steady and commanding. A collective yes sir echoed from the defenders, prompting Tobias to nod in approval. He glanced over at Dylan, who wore a smile of satisfaction. This is a fantastic plan, Tobias, Dylan remarked. It's not over yet, Tobias replied, his gaze fixed on the approaching horde. Reaching into the bag once more, he retrieved another boat horn and unleashed another ear-splitting blast into the air. As the screeching sound filled the air for another minute, Tobias tossed the horn aside, a determined glint in his eyes. I just want to make sure every one of those abominations knows that we're here, he explained. Dylan nodded in silent agreement as they refocused their attention on the encroaching threat, 
tightening their grip on their spears in preparation for the ongoing battle. Over the next hour, the group stood their ground, facing wave after wave of zombies as the creatures from the farthest reaches of the community gradually closed in on them. Finally, Tobias stepped forward, delivering a decisive spear strike to the face of the last remaining zombie. As the creature fell to the ground, he surveyed the scene with a nod of satisfaction. Nearly 150 bodies littered the ground, some stacked three or four high, all motionless. Tobias turned to the members of his group, who were now standing up and stretching, their muscles weary after the prolonged battle. I want you all to know how very proud I am of each and every one of you, Tobias declared, his voice filled with genuine appreciation. I know that not all of you share my belief that we are doing the Lord's work in purifying the land of these abominations, and that's okay. We all fight for our own reasons, but what matters is that we are fighting. He paused, allowing his words to sink in before continuing. We have done a good thing here today, one that will benefit not just our community, but the survivors in this one as well. But there is still more to be done. Tobias gestured to Sawyer and Grayson, who were approaching with the others. Each of you take a truck and a partner, drive down every street you see, and make sure that this community is free from threat, he instructed. Sawyer and Grayson nodded in understanding, selecting a few individuals from their group to accompany them. Together, they headed towards the trucks, ready to survey the community. I want you all to take some time to recuperate. There is food and water in the back of the trucks, Tobias said. As everyone dispersed to enjoy a well-deserved break, Dylan and Tobias remained, standing amidst the aftermath of the battle. Tobias let out a heavy sigh, his emotions stirring within him. So much death, and for what? Dylan pondered aloud, his voice tinged with sadness. I don't know, Dylan, Tobias replied, his own emotions bubbling to the surface, and I figure that even if I knew the cause behind it all, it still wouldn't make sense. Do you think this is happening everywhere? Dylan inquired, his eyes scanning the horizon. Tobias nodded solemnly, placing a comforting hand on his friend's shoulder. I've heard stories from as far away as Seattle that this is happening there. We really are living in a different world now, Tobias confirmed. If that's the case, then I just have to say how fortunate we are to have a leader like you, Dylan remarked earnestly. Tobias was momentarily struck speechless by Dylan's words. He realized that his role as a leader extended far beyond simply dispatching zombies. People were looking to him for guidance and direction in this new uncertain world. Before Tobias could respond, Dylan pointed towards a nearby house where a middle-aged couple emerged, their expressions a mix of shock and curiosity. It looks like the neighbors are coming out for a chat, Dylan observed. It would be rude if we didn't go introduce ourselves, Tobias agreed. Approaching the couple, Tobias and Dylan exchanged greetings with the husband, Avery, and his wife, Cindy. Avery expressed his gratitude for their efforts. Are you boys a sight for sore eyes? That's some mighty fine work you put in there, Avery commended, extending his hand for a shake which Tobias accepted. I'm Avery, and this is my wife Cindy. We're down here on vacation from St. Louis, Avery introduced. Welcome to our community. I'm Tobias, and this is my friend Dylan, Tobias replied warmly. It's a pleasure, Dylan added. Avery's curiosity was piqued. So where are you boys from? And why in the world are you coming down here to fight those things like that? We are from just up the road in Everglade City. And it is our mission from the Lord to purify the land of these abominations, Tobias explained with conviction. Avery and Cindy exchanged a glance, seemingly unsure of how to respond to Tobias's declaration. After a brief moment of contemplation, Avery offered a nonchalant shrug. Alrighty then, whatever gets you out of bed in the morning, I suppose he remarked, his tone light-hearted. Dylan seized the opportunity to steer the conversation towards more practical matters. Avery, do you know of any other survivors out here? Avery considered for a moment before responding. There's a nice couple in the house next to us, been chatting with them through open windows. Outside of that, I really couldn't tell you. We've been locked inside ever since this whole mess started. It's okay. If there are other survivors, I'm sure they heard the boat horn, Dylan reassured him. I know we sure did. 
not much to do besides sleep in these days. That jolted my butt straight up in the bed. I don't need any coffee today, that's for sure, Avery chuckled, prompting a light laugh from Dylan. However, Tobias's demeanor shifted as he focused his attention on Avery with a discerning gaze. May I ask what you did for a living? Tobias inquired. Avery explained, Well, sure, I owned a handful of barbecue joints, and the missus here did the books. So you were an accountant? Tobias assumed. Cindy interjected firmly. Sir, I was a lot more than just a number cruncher. I was in charge of inventory, ordering, and pretty much everything that wasn't grilling or smoking meat. Tobias's expression transformed into a broad smile as he looked upwards momentarily, silently mouthing some words. Avery and Cindy exchanged puzzled glances, unsure of what was transpiring. After a moment, Tobias redirected his attention back to them. It is no accident that you were the first people we met, Tobias began, his tone earnest. Our mission is more than simply purifying the land. We must also take great care in rebuilding as well. He pointed towards Cindy, addressing her directly. Cindy, you know how to manage supplies and allocate them properly. We have two communities filled with goods that must last us for an indeterminate amount of time. Will you take charge of that job and help ensure that we allocate our resources properly? Cindy pondered Tobias's request for a moment before nodding in agreement. If you think it will help, I will, she affirmed. Tobias smiled warmly at her response. Wonderful. And Avery, you know how to feed a lot of people. Well, we have a lot of people who are going to need food. Will you take charge of that job? Avery's expression turned more contemplative, and he hesitated before responding. Tobias, I'm going to level with you. I am one hell of a cook, as long as it's some form of dead animal. It don't matter if it's from the land or sea. If you put it in front of me, I'm going to make it the single best thing you've ever put in your mouth. Now the problem is, outside of some canned meat that's lurking in the back of someone's cupboard, there's not going to be a lot I'm going to be able to do. I'm not saying I won't try. I just want to make sure your expectations are tempered a bit. Tobias's smile didn't falter at Avery's admission. Instead, he responded with reassurance. Don't worry, Avery. The Lord will provide. Chapter 11 The next morning, Tobias embarked on a northward journey, heading towards their designated defensive position located half a mile away from the highway. The highway lacked an off-ramp, featuring only a simple intersection. The group had collectively agreed on this location, strategically positioned to maintain surveillance of the road through binoculars while remaining inconspicuous to passing creatures. Upon arrival, Tobias spotted Isabel waving to him from the barricade. Utilizing metal barriers crafted from car hoods, they had fortified their position to span the entire width of the road. With dense brush and water flanking either side, they felt secure from potential threats approaching laterally. Exiting the vehicle, Tobias was greeted by Isabel, who had momentarily left her post among the trio keeping watch. Good morning, Tobias. How are you? Isabel inquired as Tobias approached. I'm good, Isabel, Tobias responded, acknowledging her with a nod. Tobias halted, turning around and extending his arm back into the truck to retrieve a thermos before handing it over to Isabel. What do we have here? Isabel inquired, curiosity lighting up her features. I know you four have been out here all night, so I thought you could use some coffee, Tobias explained. Isabel eagerly opened the thermos, inhaling deeply and releasing a contented sigh as the rich aroma enveloped her senses. Oh, that is just heaven, she remarked. Savor it, because it's going to be in short supply before too long, Tobias cautioned with a wry smile. Isabel nodded in understanding, gesturing for Tobias to join her in inspecting the defensive line. We have things pretty well secured here. Nothing is getting around us thanks to Mother Nature, she reported confidently. And the barricade itself? Tobias inquired. Dylan had a great idea, so we added some foldable legs on either side of every well point. They flip down and dig into the pavement, giving us a little more stability, Isabel explained, pride evident in her tone. Excellent. And are you getting along with your watchmates? Tobias inquired, his concern extending beyond just their physical defenses. Yeah, they're pretty good. 
went to school with one of them, and a couple more are from up north, so it's interesting chatting with them, Isabel replied, a hint of camaraderie in her voice. Good. Do you need anything? Tobias offered. I think we're okay. Grayson's team is going to be relieving us in a couple hours, Isabel reassured him. Okay, I have the radio if you think of anything, Tobias said. Thanks, Tobias. Tobias nodded, his gaze shifting towards his truck as he prepared to depart. As he moved, the radio buzzed to life. Tobias, do you copy? Dylan asked. What is it, Dylan? Tobias inquired. We have visitors at the southern docks, Dylan said. Please greet them. I'm at the northern barricade, so it's going to be a few minutes, Tobias instructed. Copy that, Dylan confirmed. With that settled, Tobias slid back into his truck, the engine purring to life as he set off towards town. It was a pleasant journey, the wind tousling his hair as he rolled down the window. For the first time since the chaos had begun, he felt a sense of calm wash over him. Upon reaching Everglades City, he slowed his pace, taking in the scene of bustling activity. Residents were out in force, working together to restore order to their community. Some were clearing debris, while others were organizing supplies salvaged from abandoned homes. Spotting Cindy outside the school, Tobias pulled over, greeted by her waving figure. I only have a moment, Cindy. Is everything all right? He inquired. Everything's fine, Tobias. It's nothing urgent. I just wanted to discuss rationing, Cindy replied. For canned goods, let's start with a thousand calories a day, Tobias suggested. That might leave people feeling quite hungry, Cindy pointed out. If things go as planned, it won't be for long. But I'll be back soon to discuss it further, Tobias assured her. With a nod of understanding, Cindy let him continue on his way. Tobias resumed his journey, driving south towards Chokoloski. Upon arrival, he found the scene much the same, survivors working tirelessly to salvage what they could. Ignoring the urge to investigate further, Tobias made his way to the southernmost point of town. There, he spotted Maria beckoning him towards a house. Hey Tobias, your timing is impeccable. Dylan is welcoming our guests, Maria called out. How many are there? Tobias inquired. Three boats, just as you requested, Maria replied. That's a promising sign. Let's go, Tobias said. The two of them strolled through the house, emerging onto the back deck where Dylan and Victor were seated. Victor, a sturdy man in his thirties, bore the marks of his seafaring life, his appearance slightly disheveled from days spent on the water. Ah, there you are, Tobias. Let me introduce Victor, Dylan announced. Victor rose from his seat, extending a handshake to Tobias. It's been good talking to you over the last few days. Nice to finally put a name to a face, Victor greeted. Likewise, Victor. Is there anything we can get you? Tobias inquired. Dylan sprang into action at once. The kettle should be about ready to boil. I'll fix us all some coffee. Tobias nodded as Dylan hurried off. I have to say, Tobias, I was a little skeptical when you said you were clearing out this community. But here we are, sitting out in the open air, enjoying the nice breeze, Victor remarked. There's far too much at stake for me to lie or exaggerate about what we're doing, Tobias replied earnestly. Fair enough, and I really appreciate your candor, Victor acknowledged. Dylan returned with a tray of steaming coffee mugs, placing it on the table for everyone to enjoy. Oh, that is good stuff, Victor remarked after taking a sip. Now, Tobias, you said you wanted to discuss an arrangement with our flotilla of refugees. I do. I believe we both have things to offer each other, Tobias confirmed. Such as? Victor inquired. Please don't take offense, but you do look a little worse for wear after living on the high seas for the last week. I can't imagine that storm we had the other night was much fun to experience on the water, Tobias pointed out. I can safely say that it was not. So many seasick people, Victor agreed. Well, as you can see, we fully control a port as the only highway into it. So when a storm comes up or your people need a break, 
we have a safe landing spot, Dylan chimed in. Not only that, but by our initial count, there's at least 150 vacant homes between here and Everglades City. While most of them aren't five-star accommodations, at least they don't sway back and forth constantly, Tobias added. That does sound appealing. I know of several families that would do anything to get off their boat. It's hard enough on the adults, but the kids are really having a rough time with it, Victor admitted. Well, if we strike an agreement, they would be more than welcome to come on land permanently, Tobias assured him. So what do you want in return? Victor inquired. We need food. There are a lot of mouths to feed, and quite frankly, not a lot of ways for us to feed them. At least not in the short term. You have boats, and I assume people who know how to fish and capture other seafood, Tobias explained. We do. In fact, I even brought you a sampling of what we've been able to catch over the last week. If we come to an agreement, there's a lot more on the boats we brought, Victor offered. Victor gestured towards a cooler on the patio, prompting Dylan to rise and reveal its contents, a tempting array of fish and seafood. That looks tasty, Dylan remarked. Especially after Avery puts his magic touch on it, Tobias added with a hint of admiration. So, we agree on what we each have to offer. The only question is, what's the price of admission? Victor posed. Tobias met his gaze steadily. Everything. Victor's eyes widened, almost spitting out his coffee in astonishment at the audacious demand. You want everything we catch? Just so that we can occasionally park our boats here? Victor asked. You misunderstand me, Victor. This is not community versus community. If you agree to my offer, then we are one community, working as a single unit towards a common goal, Tobias explained earnestly. And what exactly is that goal? Victor inquired, leaning forward with a furrowed brow. To purify this land of those abominations and rebuild our society into a better one, Tobias declared with unwavering conviction. Victor studied him intently, leaning in further, his arms on the table. You're serious about killing all of those things, aren't you? Victor asked, his voice tinged with a mix of incredulity and intrigue. It is my calling, Victor, Tobias affirmed solemnly. Okay, are you familiar with Marco Island? Victor questioned. Yes, the barrier island that's about 30 miles to the east of here. What of it? Tobias replied, curiosity piqued. It's where I'm from, born and raised. When I had to flee from there, I left everything behind. I would like to go home one day, and I'm not the only one in my group that wants that. Now, if I agree to your terms, I want your word that when you set out to purify the land, that you start there, Victor proposed. Tobias pondered for a moment, aware of the monumental task ahead. Marco Island was vast compared to the small communities they had cleared out thus far. He lifted his gaze to the sky, silently mouthing a few words before nodding and turning back to Victor across the table. You have a deal. One week from today, we will begin the purification of Marco Island, Tobias declared with unwavering determination. Victor's eyes widened in agreement, recognizing the resolve in Tobias' eyes. He reached out, extending his hand for a firm shake. Okay, I believe you. We have a deal, Victor affirmed. Wonderful. If you want to radio your people and instruct the families who wish to get back on solid land to come up, we will get them situated, Tobias suggested. Victor rose from his seat, shaking hands with Tobias once more. I look forward to working with you, Tobias. And I look forward to working with you, Victor, Tobias replied sincerely. As Victor walked away, Dylan and Maria approached, flanking Tobias. Marco Island? We're going to need a lot more than a few spears and some car hoods for that, Dylan remarked. That place is huge, 15, maybe even 20,000 people, Maria added, concern evident in her voice. Do not worry. It will take effort, but with the Lord on our side, anything is possible, Tobias reassured them. Maria and Dylan nodded in agreement, placing their hands on Tobias' shoulders. And once we succeed in purifying the island, we will have the resources and manpower to continue marching on. Make no mistake, Marco Island is not an end goal, merely a stepping stone, Tobias declared, 
his voice filled with conviction. Both Maria and Dylan nodded in understanding as the three of them gazed out to the water, ready to embark on their mission to reclaim this world for the living. The end.